speeds running.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the September Recreational Astronomy Night Meet. Welcome to the September Recreational Astronomy Night Meeting online edition of the Toronto Centre RSA. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Paul Markov. Um, aside from introducing the speakers, I also search for presentations uh, for upcoming meetings. So if you have a presentation in mind, please get in touch with me. We have openings for the October and uh, later meetings. Um, we have four speakers uh, for this evening instead of the usual three, but I still expect that it will be done by about 9.30 this evening. And uh, But before uh, we start the meeting, uh, I would like to thank uh, in advance our technical team comprised of uh, Andrew and Better Reed, Blake Nancaro, uh, Ward Legro, and Anya Chalucci. Uh, thank you for making these uh, online presentations possible. Um, the speakers for this evening are as follows. We have Chris Vaughn uh, presenting the sky this month. Uh, next is Colin Hegg. Uh, he's the Director of Marketing at Diffraction Limited. And uh, his uh, topic is Astro Imaging, uh, Canadian Connections. Uh, next is Arushi Naf, uh, perhaps one of our youngest presenters. Um, she will talk to us about how she traveled around the universe for six years to complete her uh, RESC Explore the Universe certificate. And then Joel Dick uh, will talk to us about 30 astronomy book recommendations from his library. And then finally, uh, our president, Ralph Chu, will wrap up the evening with the announcements. Um, if you have questions for our speakers, uh, please enter them in the YouTube chat box. And uh, Blake Nancaro will ask uh, the speaker uh, the question on your behalf. And uh, if you're attending a Toronto Centre meeting for the first time, whether you're a member or not, please let us know through the chat box as well. Um, I think we're ready to get the meeting started. Uh, with uh, Chris Bond and the sky this month. Take it away, Chris. Thanks, Paul. So the period I'm covering tonight is going to run from tonight, September 16th to mid-October, October 14th, 2020. And as you can see, uh, spoiler alert, there's gonna be something about Mars in this talk. Before I get going, I'd like to though acknowledge some of the images that I'm using in my slides from uh, members and friends, including Stu McNair, Steve McKinney, Michael Watson, and Lynn Hilborn. This image is uh, background images of the Milky Way by uh, Michael Watson. He has a fantastic uh, gallery of uh, astro imagery on his Flickr page. So if you search for Michael Watson on Flickr, you can pick up, uh, take a look at some of his uh, wonderful shots. Uh, in case you're um, you don't have time to listen for the whole to the whole car, whole presentation, and just want the the highlights, the bullet points off the top. Uh, here are the the key key figures. We've got longer nights this time of year. Yay! We've got nine hours of imaging time for those that are into astro imaging. We were dealing with wildfire smoke lately, and I'll show you a map in a minute. Uh, it's now aurora season, so at this time of the year, the Earth's magnetic field isn't quite as uh, as able to fend off the, the sun's blast. So uh, we tend to get a little more aurora during around the equinoxes. Uh, we have Mars at its closest approach on October 6th and opposition on the 13th. There's a period of um, time where we can see the zodiacal light in the mornings uh, now and again um, um, a month from now. Uh, the Orion day meteor shower has already begun, just, just dribs and drabs, but uh, you can keep your eye out for some. They peak next month, and uh, we have an occultation of the moon of a star by the moon on September 30th, and lots of International Space Station passes. A uh, little bit of news on space exploration. So it's to be determined when exactly, but in the next little while, we're going to see a launch by Virgin Orbit of their Launcher One rocket. And this is the rocket that gets uh, taken up into the uh, high high altitude on a Boeing 747 and then released and then the rocket engine ignites and takes the payload to orbit and it's going to be delivering about 14 cube sats uh, for NASA field centers, educational institutions and laboratories. You can see the details there. And then on September 17th, that's tomorrow at 2, 2 17 p.m. We have scheduled a SpaceX to launch more Starlink satellites. Yay, astronomers. <laughs> And then there's a series, there are a series of launches after that in the coming uh, days and weeks of Starlink Series 12, 13, and so on. 
Finally, um, around uh, the time of our next meeting, October 14th, we have the next crewed um, mission launching from Russia uh, up to the space station. So that'll be a crew change happening around that time. Uh, here's the smoke map. So this is coming from an app called Astrospheric, which was one of the apps I like to use for predicting uh, observing conditions when I'm planning my observing sessions. And they have an option in the, uh, the upper left corner of their, um, of their web interface that lets you click for a map of the smoke um, conditions in your area. And you can see here, I've got uh, Toronto with a bullseye and all the purple color would represent a high concentration of, of smoke, which is wafted in from the West Coast uh, wildfires. They really kicked in around, around sort of Sunday mornings, uh, Monday night. Um, I was out observing at the Car Astronomical Observatory on Sunday night. The sky was fine, but Monday night it was very poor with uh, transparency due to the smoke. Uh, forecast right now is that the smoke is expected to diminish or to dissipate somewhat by Friday, which is sort of still in our, um, in our dark skies uh, when it week. So hope, let's fingers crossed that we get a little break on the smoke. Uh, as I said at the top, we've got a period of time where we can see the morning zodiacal light. And this is a nice picture of it. This is this faint band of light you can see on the uh, center left part of the, the image. This is taken by Stu McNair two years ago in October. And what the zodiacal light is, it's, it's particles of, small particles of debris that are concentrated in the plane of the solar system. And when the ecliptic is quite vertical with respect to the horizon, then the sun can drop well below the horizon and the sun light scattering off these particles can be visible as a faint glow, sort of, sort of bracketing or saddling, saddling across the ecliptic. And it happens in September, October in the morning, and it happens in sort of March, April in the evening. So we have our first of two sort of windows for the zodiacal light um, happening between now and the full moon on October 1st. And I know you're thinking, well, if I'm looking for a faint band of light, why am I talking about full moon? And that's because the moon is on the other side of the sky from where it is. So we really get that opportunity to see it even while the moon is, is waxing in phase just because it's half the world half the sky away from where the zodiacal light is. So for about half an hour before sunrise or before dusk, before dawn, um, you can look east and it's in the zone sort of between below, between Venus, Regulus and that, in that sort of patch of the sky. There's another opportunity to see it on October 14th when the window again opens for two weeks. Um, in terms of our, our observing time, uh, our amount of dark, we've got sun, uh, sunset happening tonight at 7.24 p.m. Sun rises around 7 a.m. So that gives us uh, 12 and a half hours of daylight. By our next meeting, four weeks from now, we'll have earlier sunsets at 6.34 and the amount of daylight will have dropped um, by almost an hour and a half. And you can see um, we also, in the meantime, we're going to have our, our northern autumnal equinox occurring on September 22nd in the morning at 9.31 a.m. And as I said, the Earth's magnetic field has a vector. It has north components and east-west components. And the north component of the Earth's magnetic field is a little bit diminished because at the equinox, the uh, Earth's magnetic field is tipped a bit sideways with, with respect to the sun, the sun in our orbit. And that allows a bit more of the sun's energy to penetrate our protective uh, magnetic barrier. And we, so we sometimes get enhanced aurora happening near the equinoxes. But what the imagers are really interested in are the dark, dark nights, the dark sky. And, and we define the end of astronomical twilight as the period when the sun is more than 18 degrees below the horizon. So the sky is as black as it's going to get. And that'll last until the sun you know, starts to rise and it's more than 18 degrees below the morning, uh, the sky, the horizon in the morning. So tonight or today, we've got the astronomical twilight ending at 9.02 p.m. And starting at 5.22, that gives us about eight eight hours and 20 minutes of dark imaging time right now. And that's uh, actually increasing by about three minutes a day. A month from now, that gets bumped to about nine hours and 45 minutes of total imaging time. So we've got to fend with the colder temperatures, which is good for cameras, not so good for maybe the astronomers, but um, we certainly like the, the dark uh, winter skies for that reason, lots of imaging time. 
And if you look at this graph through the year of the uh, balance between daytime and nighttime, you can see we're sitting here in the, the fall and the amount of daytime is sort of reducing and the amount of nighttime is increasing. It's the same principle, just in graph form. Uh, in terms of the moon phenomenon, we've got uh, the new moon happening tomorrow at tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. And it gives us another, you know, one or two days of, uh, of dark evening skies before the, the moon starts to be bothersome again. The next first quarter moon will happen on September 23rd. And then the full moon, which is the harvest moon, will be on Thursday, October 1st. And the harvest moon is defined as the full moon that occurs closest to the equinox yeah, in the autumn. Uh, last year it was in September, this year it's in October. And the last quarter moon is on October 9th. And just for good measure, the International Observe the Moon Night is going to take advantage of that first quarter moon and follow it a few days later on the weekend, Saturday, September 26th. Um, if you're interested in the phenomenon of the harvest moon, so because the ecliptic, which is the yellow line I'm showing on my screen here, is very shallow uh, in the evening time. And remember, the zodiacal light has the steep ecliptic in the morning. So there's a, if one does the one and the other does the other. So we have the very shallow ecliptic in the evening. We have the moon's orbit sort of sub parallel to the ecliptic. And so when the moon travels along its orbit day after day, it's doing a lot more left right motion than it is up down motion. And the result of that is that the moon only rises about 20 minutes later, night after night after night around the full harvest moon. So here we have the, the rise times of the moon centered on October 1st. And you can see there's really only 20, 21 minutes delay night to night around this time. And that gave the, the farmers and everyone else working in the fields a bit more time to work because they were being uh, blessed by all that um, bright moonlight to help, help, to help see their way. Uh, now, just in case you're wondering, the moon normally rises much later, much, much more delay than 20 minutes. So around the winter solstice, the moon rises more than an hour later, night after night. Uh, here's a graphical representation of the, the upcoming month starting uh, tonight's meeting here on the 16th. So we have good dark sky observing in the red windows, the red boxes up until about Sunday. And then the moon's getting a little bit bright in the evening sky. And then we get to third quarter on the 10th of October and that opens up another good 10 days or so of, uh, of dark moonless evenings for us to work in. Now, the big news of the month is Mars. Mars is, is going to uh, be reaching both its closest approach to Earth and opposition. And this is going to be, uh, oppositions of Mars occur about every 27 months. And so the last time we had an opposition to Mars, two years ago, the whole planet was shrouded in dust. And so far, so good. We've been looking at Mars and it's still clear viewing. So we might be, we might be good sailing or clear sailing in this case. But this, this close approach to Mars is not quite as, as, as close to Mars as it was uh, in 2018, but it will be the closest one we get for the next 15 years or so. And this is a sort of a top-down schematic of our solar system, and I've just enlarged Mars and, and Earth uh, sort of just to give you a, a better and easier way of seeing them. And so you can see that the, the orbits of Mars and Earth are not concentric on the Sun. They're both a little bit elliptical, and so you can see that there are places when the distance between the two orbits is narrower and wider. And so what happens that we're lining up on the same side of the sun in early October. This is um, actually the night of the closest approach. So the minimum distance between the Earth and Mars will happen around 2 a.m. on October the 6th. So that evening of the 5th and then into the 6th would be your, the time of the year or the, the moment when Mars is closest. So it's got its biggest disk biggest size disk and the distance at that time will be about 62 million kilometers or less than half an astronomical unit which is the astronomical unit is the average distance between the earth and the sun and uh, for those interested in, in radio signals and talking to spacecraft it's three almost three minutes three and a half light minutes time delay to communicate with mars uh, one way so you can see there's a slight angle here between the earth to the sun and mars to the sun but yet that's the night on the sixth when they're closest to closest together. At that time, Mars will be uh, at a visual magnitude of minus 2.56. As I said, it's gonna have a disk size at a maximum of 22.5 second arc seconds. And just for comparison, if you've looked at Jupiter in your telescope, J 
Jupiter is Jupiter will be about twice that. So Mars will be substantial, but uh, not nowhere near as big as Jupiter's disk. Um, if you're observing Mars that night, Mars will be at its highest in the southern sky around one a around two a.m. And at that point, it'll be about 51 degrees altitude or more than halfway up the southern sky. Now, Mars's day is, is not quite an hour longer than Earth's day, when that means that if you look at Mars at the same time of the night, Earth time, night after night, Mars will have rotated a little bit, uh, a little bit less than a full rotation. So that means over a sequence of nights, you'll actually see slightly different sections of Mars. So if you want to look at Mars through a telescope on October 5th, 6th, here are a few of the major features that you can look for. You'll see the pattern of the, um, um, the south polar cap. So the southern polar cap, Mars recently uh, started its southern uh, summer. So the southern polar cap is actually shrinking right now, but it is tilted towards the inner solar system. So it sort of favored our view. The North Polar Cap at the other end would be kind of out of sight for us. So the South Polar Cap will look like a small bright point near the uh, limb, of, limb of the planet. And then you wanna look for these bright and dark areas. I mean, you won't be able to, to get perhaps clear boundaries on them, but you'll be able to get a sense of a bright area, a dark area in your telescope, depending on the size and depending on the seeing conditions that you've got. So. Um, this is a picture of what Mars will show us towards Earth on that night of October 5th, 6th. You go for the dark, prominent, uh, very dark area called Sirtis Major. You go for a very bright, sort of round area called Hellas. And then there are other Mare and things like that um, that'll, that'll create sort of a pattern. And it's fun to sketch what you see and uh, then compare it to an app or a, or a planetarium software to see if you can match it. Now, this... This is taken from Stellarium, and what I've done is I've left the right, I left Mars right way up. So your telescope, depending on its type, might flip Mars left and right, or it might flip Mars upside down. So if you have a Newtonian reflector telescope or a Dobsonian reflector telescope, it's going to flip Mars upside down, so the polar cap will be at the top. Okay. If you have a refractor telescope with a diagonal on it, then probably it might just flip it left, right. Same, same might be true for um, the schmidt cassegrain telescope, one of the uh, compound telescopes. Now, about a week later, on the uh, 14th of October at 2 a.m., will be the exact moment of opposition. And at that time, the Earth will be between Mars and the Sun. That means Mars rises as the Sun sets, and then sets as the Sun rises. So Mars is visible all night long. Um, it's past its largest appearance, but it's now at its brightest appearance. So Mars will actually shine at visual magnitude minus 2.62 that night. Its disk size will be slightly, slightly smaller than it was a week earlier, but it's not going to make any difference. So you really want to take advantage of that whole uh, period from the 6th to the 12th, even starting a few days before and, and, and continuing a few days after. Now, Earth and Mars line up about every 27 months, and that means that in 27 months, the Earth will go around the sun twice and add three months more. So it's going to do another quarter of its orbit. So the next time Mars and Earth line up, you can see that the, the distance between the two orbits is much greater. And then again, much greater. And then we have to wait about 15 years for us to get back into the time when they line up, where the two orbits are closer to one another. So on the a week later, as I said, on the 14th, now Mars is going to be uh, trans are culminating or high in the southern sky at about one o'clock instead of two o'clock. So you can actually start, you know, seeing it a little bit higher earlier in the evening than it was. And it'll again be about 51 degrees high. And in a week, the amount of rotation of the planet will produce a slightly different view. Here is still the Hellas area and the Sirtis Major, which will now be sort of tucked into the top corner. And again, it might flip in your telescope. Uh, now we've got another area called Hesperia, and you might even be able to see this little dark Mare here. And we're getting into the Tharsis and Mount, uh, Olympus Mons and Mountain area um, uh, later on. So keep watching even beyond the 13th, 14th, and over the course of, um, you can also you know look look well into the night and see more Mars rotation, or you can look night after night over the course of 10, 15 days, and really get to see almost the whole planet except for the extreme northern part of the planet. 
by doing that. Um, if you want to find a nice map that's annotated, which shows the names of all these features much more than I have here, uh, here's a link here. Cara, karmalimbo.com, Aeropix, Refer, Mars Map Hole is a nice one that I used in preparation of the talk tonight. Uh, just to give you an idea of the brightness of Mars and the size of its disk in your telescope. So here's, the, here's how Mars looks through the year 2020. And you can see that the angular size of the planet will peak here on October 6th. And then about a week later, these two graphs are offset about about a week. That's when it's gonna be at its brightest. But again, around this time, and you can see that it's sort of slowly ramping up in size and brightness, but it's going to drop off a little faster. So you really want to take advantage of this period and, and, and get a look. But bear in mind that in the weeks following opposition, Mars will actually uh, stay higher in the sky. So it'll actually be a, a, up in an observable height at a much more convenient time, even though it might be a little less bright and a little, a little less uh, large in size. Uh, meteor showers that are coming up this month. We have the Draconids meteor shower that's running uh, in early October from the 6th to the 10th. Um, start watching that one right after dusk because the radiant for that shower is in Draco, which is in the evening sky, high in the evening sky. You want to watch for meteor showers when their radiants are well above the horizon. Otherwise, you're missing meteors that are hidden by the bulk of the Earth. And so the Drac Draconids shower is best of you in the evening time. Um, this is a highly variable shower. It's not a major shower of the year, but you want to, you know, keep an eye out. You may see a few. I'm not sure how many you'll get this year. Um, and the peak night to watch is sort of uh, the 7th and 8th. Uh, there is a waning gibbous moon that will rise at about 10 p.m. So, you know, start looking as soon as it gets dark and keep an eye out for them because by the time you get into late evening, you're going to be competing with the moon. Uh, as I mentioned, the Orionid shower is a long duration shower. It starts around the 27th of, uh, 23rd of September and runs into late November. But of course, meteor showers ramp up and then they have a peak. And uh, the most meteors occur around the peak nights, around the peak night. So the peak for the Orionids isn't until the next person's sky this month. I think that's Arnold Brody. So he'll talk about it more of it then around October 21, 22. Um, uh, luckily for us, the the moon will set early that evening, and the Orionids are a, um, a midnight to dawn, sort of a um, best time, so the moon will not be competing with them at all. Uh, tip for meteor watching, um, you can, the radiant of the shower is the apparent source of the sky where the meteors are emanating from, give the shower their name, but you don't want to watch the radiant because those meteors are coming straight at you and they won't have very long tails at all. So you really want to get an open sky and watch anywhere you just, just pay attention to the whole sky. Don't use binoculars, don't use telescopes for meteors. So there's a, there's a picture um, from a, a NASA astronomy picture of the day showing the, how the meteors are radiating from the constellation of Orion here in the middle. If you're wanting to see the International Space Station, we're currently in a very uh, busy set of evening passes, uh, lots of very bright passes. So the magnitude number, the more negative it is, the brighter the space station will appear to your eyes. And a minus three, uh, minus three or 3.9 is extremely bright. So brighter than Venus, which is a bright planet. Um, here's a list of um, when some of the brighter ones are coming up. You can see that they're mostly sort of in the 8.15 to 10 p.m. range, so at a nice convenient time. The space station goes over around the Earth every 90 minutes. It's constantly passing overhead, but we only can see it um, when the sky is dark and when the sun has gone down, but the space station can still see the sunlight, it's still bathed in sunlight. So it's really post-sunset and pre-dawn. And uh, if you want to find out when the space station is visible wherever you are, the best advice is to go to the website called heavens-above.com, enter your location, and then click on the link. There are links of various um, satellite sets, but you want to click on ISS, and it'll give you that table showing you when it rises, when it's at highest, when it's at lowest, and its brightness, and so on. I also summarize when the space station's passing over in my weekly astronomy skylights newsletter designed for the GTA area. So if you're wanting to check that out, you can receive it in your inbox, or you can go to astrogeo.ca slash skylights and uh, see the list of them there. Uh, the moon is going to uh, occult or pass in front of a a naked eye star on September 30th. The star is named as 33 Piscium or 
or it's in the constellation of Pisces. So it's uh, the genitive of Pisces is Piscium. And that will happen from 8, 10 p.m. The sky won't be quite dark yet until 9.20 p.m. when it'll pop out. So at 8.20, the moon will cover the star here. And by 9.20, the star will reappear from the opposite side of the moon. Now the moon's about full that night, but the star should be readily visible in binoculars and certainly in telescopes. Just don't magnify the moon too much so that if you're not clear exactly where the star is going to reappear from, you don't want to zoom in on the wrong patch of the moon and then miss it. So just use a sort of a full-sized or a full view of the moon and then watch for that uh, star to reappear. There's another one happening on October 3rd. That's a different star. That's the star New Piscium or Piscium, New Piscium. And that's going to be in the uh, after midnight time. So it's not as convenient. All right, I'm going to switch to Stellarium and give you a little tour of what's happening to the moon and planets. Uh, right now we've got in the morning sky, which I'll switch to here. If you've been up early, you'll have seen, let me get over to the east here, there we go. Venus has been gleaming in the eastern sky for a number of months now. It's already finished its greatest elongation from the sun and it's now swinging back towards the sun to superior conjunction. So while it's swinging sunward, it's also moving a bit farther from us. It's going to end up on the far side of the sun from us. Um, you can see that night after night or morning after morning, I should say, the planet is dropping with respect to the background stars. So it's currently among the stars of Cancer, which is tomorrow morning here. And then it'll be dropping down and heading towards Leo in the next, uh, next couple of weeks. So Venus rises about 3.30 in the morning. It's disk size, which shows a, if I can get you a close up of Venus here. So you can see it's a, it's a gibbous phase. It's actually uh, waxing slowly, gradually. So it'll look about the same as this for a number of weeks. And it'll stay visible in our skies until about mid-December. On the 22nd of the month, it's actually going to pass fairly close to the asteroid Vesta, about uh, two degrees south of Vesta. And then in early October, it's going to pass on the sort of the second and the third, it's going to be uh, less than a finger's width away from the star Regulus, if you're interested in seeing something uh, with a planet and a star in the telescope at the same time. All right, let's go back to now, and I'm just going to bring up Mercury here. So Mercury has been um, lingering in the western sky after sunset for quite a while now, but you can see because of that steep evening ecliptic, we really can't see it. It's really hugging the horizon for us. But if you live at a southern latitude, so there's Mercury there. If you live at a southern latitude or in the southern, southern hemisphere, Mercury is, is the ecliptic for you is very vertical. And so you can see Mercury uh, at its best for the year. But this is one of our worst appearances for the year. So Mercury is going to um, swing away from the sun until October 1st, and then it'll, it'll be gone uh, for, the, for good until we get our next uh, morning appearance of it. But of course, what everybody's been noticing a lot lately is Jupiter and Saturn. So Jupiter and Saturn have been hanging around here in the southern sky after dusk, not too far from the Milky Way, if you've been able to escape the city of light pollution and get into a nice dark sky. Um, right now, Jupiter and Saturn are about eight degrees apart, so that's less than your fist uh, held at arm's length with one eye closed. Um, but actually, Jupiter's faster orbit is allowing it to sort of creep closer to Saturn. So in the next month, that's going to reduce to about six degrees. And then by the end of the year, they're going to practically touch in the sky. They'll be so close together, it'll be, it'll be crazy. Uh, Jupiter's about 10 times brighter than Saturn, so you've got to wait uh, for the sky to get a little darker before Saturn pops out. Um, if you want to look at some of the neat features on Jupiter, of course, you've got the Great Red Spot. The Great Red Spot takes about three hours to cross the planet, but that's only visible about every second or third night for us because Jupiter's um, day is only 10 hours. And so by the time we've done 24, it's done two and a half revolutions. So we ought to wait for the red, red spot to reappear. Um, you can also catch 
a few of the uh, the shadow transits with the, the Jupiter's one of four, one or more of Jupiter's little Galilean moons cast their, their round black shadows on the planet. And again, those take two or three or hours to cross the planet as well. And if you're if the air is steady and you've got um, a reasonable size telescope, you know, a three or four inch diameter aperture telescope and good seeing conditions, you can see those little black spots as well as the great red spot on the planet. Uh, Saturn is going to, right now Jupiter is moving kind of retrograde west in Sagittarius. Saturn is going to do, to join it in doing that uh, at the end of the month on the 29th. And that'll allow, again, allow these two planets to start uh, sort of closing in on each other. Um, just to recap, Mars for a minute here. So if we go later in the evening, so Mars is now rising at about just before 9 p.m. now. And then you can follow it all night long. It'll be the bright, bright, uh, eye-catching reddish object uh, in the eastern sky in early evening. And then um, by the, right now, by the middle of the night, it'll transit in the south about three in the morning. So, you know, if you're getting up to go for a, a drink or to visit the washroom in the night and have a south-facing window, you might catch this bright gleaming object and that'll be Mars shining in the window. All right, now the ice giant planets, Neptune and Uranus, sort of bracketing Mars in the sky. So they're kind of middle of the night objects as well. Um, Neptune, we have here, Neptune is near a naked eye star named Phi Aquarii. This is Phi Aquarii. So if you have binoculars, you can check out, look for these two, psi, these are Psi Aquarii, these two stars close together, Phi and Hydor. Make a little triangle, look for this little triangle. And then Neptune is going to be sitting off to the left or east of them. Neptune is pretty dim, so you know, you probably want to put your telescope on it. In a telescope, it'll show the distinctive blue color that we, we all love. Uh, Neptune has recently passed its opposition within the last couple of weeks. So it's actually closest to the Earth and largest in its disk for the year. And that gives you a um, potential to, to see uh, Neptune's moon Triton. Let's see if I can bring Triton into view here. So Triton is this rather prominent moon. And the time you want to see Triton is when it's farthest away from the glare of the planet. Again, you need a big telescope and good sea conditions. But that happens around every third night or so. So you can use a planetarium app like Stellarium or something to work out when that when your odds would be the best of seeing it. And let's just run back to Uranus. So Uranus is bright enough to see in binoculars, even naked eye if your sky is ideal, but certainly binoculars and uh, backyard telescopes. It's in the constellation of Aries. So you can look for these brightest stars, Hamal and Sheridan in Aries, and sort of it makes a narrow, a skinny triangle below them in the evening sky. And it's visible all night long. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just give you a few photo ops that you can look out for. For that, I want the moon. So we've got the moon here passing the sun. bring this into view here and the moon will re will be disappeared for the next couple of days the next time we can really see it will be sort of friday saturday time frame and as we go through the month so it'll make a nice uh, a nice grouping with uh, saturn and jupiter on the 24th and the 25th and that's a neat um, instance where you can sort of wait a bit later in the evening where they're closer to the horizon and you can sort of compose uh, a great scene with some interesting foreground landscape. And then on the 2nd of October, we can see the moon sitting uh, very, very close to uh, Mars. And what's neat about this is that, let's see how long do they set? So they don't set until the sunrise. So you might even be able to get a chance to find Mars in a brighter sky using the moon as a help to do that. If I just take away the landscape here for a second. So you can just look a few degrees to the lower right of, of uh, the moon and see if you can spot Mars before they set. And let's go back. A few more dates, a few more nights. Moon's gonna pass through Taurus, through Gemini, 
through Cancer. So on the 11th, you can look for the moon sitting just near the Beehive Cluster, Messier 44 in the pre-dawn sky. The, uh, the trick there is to hide the binocular, hide the moon outside the view of your binoculars and see if you can spot the stars uh, below it. And then a couple of mornings later, we have the moon partnering up with Venus in the morning sky, another nice photo opportunity with a beautiful, pretty crescent moon in the morning sky. What I thought I'd leave you with now is highlight uh, an interesting constellation to take a tour of at this time of the year. And that's the constellation of Cepheus. I'm just gonna come back to the evening sky here. And let me turn off my orbits to make it simpler. All right. So Cepheus is a circumpolar constellation, so here's Here's Polaris down here. And Cepheus is uh, the king of the, in Greek mythology, the, the king of Ethiopia. His wife was Cassiopeia. Their daughter was Andromeda. And that led to the whole story about Andromeda and Perseus and Pegasus and the whole story. The whole family are up in the sky together. So even though Cepheus is circumpolar, it's always above the horizon for us. At this time of year, sort of September, October, November, December, in the evening sky, Cepheus is at its highest. We always want to look at objects when they're highest in the sky because then we're viewing them through the least amount of Earth's atmosphere and we get a clear, the clearest view of the object. So what I thought I'd do is give you a little, some interesting aspects of Cepheus to look at. So Cepheus, you could start with Polaris and it's the constellation right above Polaris. Another way of, of doing this is to look for Cygnus the Swan or Cassiopeia and sort of look below and between those two constellations for him. So the brightest star in Cepheus is Alderamin, which is the um, Alpha, Alpha Cephei. It's an Arabic name for the right arm. This star is unique in that it has an extremely high rotation rate. It rotates once every 12 hours compared to the sun, our sun, which rotates once every 27 days. Um, off to the side here, we have stars that are sometimes meant to represent um, the king's arm, outstretched arm. This is um, Eta Cephei. And then below that, we have his hand. I'm just going to turn off the deep sky objects so you can see a little better. Then sort of his, his elbow and his hand would be th these two stars reaching out. So those Eta and Theta Cephei. Now heading back to Old to Alderman, we can head down to Alferk. So Alferk is the beta star in the constellation. It's a pulsating variable star. It's about 690 light years away from us. Hot blue white star, 10 times the mass of our sun. It's got two close in companions that are too close for a telescope to see. But this star actually pulsates in brightness every four hour and a half hours due to iron enrichment in the star's interior. So it's got uh, unique aspect there. Then heading down to the, the bottom, we sometimes think of Cepheus as an upside down house. So you've got the house with the pointy roof. So this would be Ari, would be at the point of the roof, or this is also known as Gamma Cephei. It's an orange K-class star. It's about the same brightness as Alferk. And what's neat about this star is that in 1988, Canadian astronomers detected the signal of an extrasolar planet or an exoplanet around this star. And that would have been the first confirmed exoplanet in history, but the data wasn't definitive enough, and they were they weren't they didn't weren't willing to publish on it and, and claim the uh, claim the discovery. So that honor went to the star 51 Pegasi a few years later in 1996 or so. Uh, but now we've got better data, and we have confirmed that uh, the star has a planet that was confirmed in 2002, and that star that planet has been named Tadmor. That means it's an ancient Semitic name for the city of Palmyra in the country of Syria. Now heading back up the roof, we've got Iota. Iota is another orange class star. Again, these are all about the same brightness. And uh, you head on up. Okay, so this is Zeta. Zeta is the other corner of the box. 
And Zeta has a magnitude of 4.2. So it's a little, it's about here. Sorry, it's a magnitude is 3.35, 3 sorry. Um, but what's interesting is that there's a little star named Epsilon that has a magnitude, a dimmer magnitude of 4.15. And down here we have Delta Cephei. So Delta Cephei is the star that was the basis of the Cepheid variable system that you may have heard of. So these are stars that have a uh, known relationship between their variability period and their brightness. And in 1912, uh, astronomer Henrietta Swan Leavitt of Harvard discovered this relationship and knowing that she was able to determine the distances to various Cepheid variable stars in the universe. And we've actually discovered Cepheid variable stars in other galaxies, which is an assistance to, to determining how far they are. Now, yeah, so, so Delta Cephei varies in brightness between these two ranges that match Zeta and Epsilon. So the next time you're out, Take a look at uh, Delta Cephei and see whether you think it's at the peak of its brightness or the minimum of its brightness. If you've got your binoculars, take a look. There's a lot of uh, nebulas and clusters because Cepheus borders on the Milky Way. Uh, one of the most interesting ones is this patch above the box of Cepheus where we have the Garnet Star or Mu Cephei. This is a massive star, many thousands of times bigger than the sun. It's thousands of light years away, but it's so luminous that we can see it with our naked eye. And it's one of the reddest stars you can see in your telescope. So there's a little bit of, um, of a tour of Cepheus. It's the perfect time of the year to see it. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll end. Thank you very much. Um, I believe I was muted there. Should I repeat? All right. Sorry, uh, I was on mute unknowingly. Uh, I was saying, Chris, thank you so much for uh, the time and effort you put into the presentation. I know that it takes an awful lot of time to prepare uh, the presentation because of all the research you, you have to do. So thanks again. <clears throat> let's go to uh, maybe a couple of questions. Uh, we are a little uh, running a little bit late, so let's just uh, pervert to two questions for now. Okay. Um, uh, Joel asked a question. He was out last night around midnight and he saw Mars. It was very bright, but he couldn't find Jupiter. So um, I think the, really the question is, what time is Jupiter or are Jupiter and Saturn setting um, right now? Or was it possibly the smoke that was interfering? I think the smoke could have hidden Saturn, but not Jupiter. Um, when I was at uh, CAO, I could certainly um, see Saturn was struggling to cut through the Merck. Um, the thing about Jupiter and Saturn right now is we're, we're losing their window, our observing window for them. So really uh, by, you can see here by, you know, late evening, they're already sinking into the West. So it's possible that uh, he was just waiting a little too long. So Saturn, Jupiter right now is setting at 11.30 p.m. Oh, sorry, let me go back to today. Here we go, back to tonight. So Saturn is setting at 117, but really at midnight, it's getting kind of low in the uh, Southwest. Yeah, so so any clouds or smoke down there would make it uh, challenging. Um, yeah, or yeah, horizon clouds, sure. Uh, and I had a question for you. What's your current GRS setting, the great red spot setting in Stellarium that you're using? So the way you find that is you click F4, the sky and viewing options, go into solar system, go into custom GRS settings, and I've got 188. I haven't checked that lately, but that's what I'm using. Okay, thanks. All right, so thanks again, Chris, for a great presentation. Let's move on to our next speaker. Ooh. Colin Hegg, he's a director of marketing at the Fraction Limited. He'll talk to us about astro imaging, Canadian connections. Go ahead, Colin. Thanks, Paul. Uh, hopefully, you can all uh, see and hear me. The, uh, uh, I guess, the past couple of years, I've been uh, very busy 
after I finished my term as RESC president uh, for the society, uh, working with the team at Diffraction Limited. And uh, tonight, what I hope to do is share a little bit about some Canadian imaging experts uh, that uh, just happen to be more or less in your backyard if you consider five hour drive uh, your backyard. So with that, uh, maybe we could go to our slides and then uh, we'll uh, walk you through some of the things we've been doing, a little bit of history. And um, I'll just start by letting you know, um, Diffraction uh, was started uh, quite a while back now, about 27 years ago by Doug George. And uh, Doug, who's uh, pictured here, uh, was our uh, CEO, but he was also our ESC Society president uh, from 96 to 98. So Doug and I have this strange coincidence uh, that the RESC uh, and our uh, uh, common interests in imaging the night sky uh, come together. And Doug's a really interesting guy. He's a professional engineer. Uh, he's got a uh, master's degree. Uh, he's got uh, a patent uh, some of you may be aware of uh, that was related to the whole notion of uh, how do you get a telescope uh, to track a star? And so this uh, patent was developed with uh, Dr. Robert Morris at Carleton. And uh, that uh, patent uh, basically involved having a telescope with a motor drive control system, uh, a camera that would be attached to the back of the telescope. Uh, it would then measure the star uh, and then use some analysis work to convert that data to something. Uh, it would be able to do pointing information to tell the telescope where to point. It would be able to display the pointing information and the position of the star and so on. And so that goes back quite a few years. Uh, but of course, now all of us are used to having the ability, if we're imaging, to auto-guide and have everything just work for us. And it's all kind of magic where they're using you know, Maxim DL or other programs uh, like uh, PhD or the SkyX. So in any case, uh, so that was one of Doug's first patents and it goes back a little ways. Now, in the beginning, uh, Doug got started working uh, out of the house, quite literally. Uh, so Conover Street in Nepean, Ontario, which is a suburb of Ottawa, uh, was where he got his start and he basically turned his uh, living room into a development shop. Uh, many of you might know uh, Ajay Segal and uh, Ajay worked with Doug on a piece of software called Hidden Image. Uh, this moved forward um, and uh, many years later, six years later, uh, became a key ingredient in a very popular software program called Maxim DL. Um, I personally was one of the early customers of Maxim. I can't remember if it was version one or version two that I bought. But uh, in any case, that's uh, uh, dating me a little bit. That's over 20 years ago. And Doug also did some image analysis uh, software for people doing interferograms. In other words, uh, taking something like a telescope mirror and uh, checking the accuracy of the surface of that, how flat it was, uh, whether it had the correct curve and so on. And that resulted in a piece of software called Quick Fringe. Now, during the 90s, many of you uh, may have been around for a couple of the spectacular comets, Comet Hayakitaki and, and Hale Bopp. Uh, Doug worked with Peter Cerebolo of uh, Cerebolo Optical Systems, former Hamilton Center member like myself. And um, uh, Doug and Peter uh, worked on imaging the entire night sky using a CCD camera, some software that was built for the purpose, and an astrograph that Peter built, Peter built specifically for that. So in any case, the software um, uh, continued to evolve. And then the next thing came about was people needed dome control. Um, in the early 2000s, around 2002, 2003, uh, Sirius observatories out of Australia uh, needed a better dome control system. Uh, Doug developed what was known as Max Dome 1, and uh, that was followed a couple of years later. So some interesting history. Uh, diffraction found itself in the business of designing astronomical cameras. Um, and so things like the Orion Parsec and Celestron Nightscape. I'm not gonna tell you who designed those, but uh, in any case, so just, just be aware there was some cool stuff happening back then. Um, one of the things that uh, was an attempt at a planetarium software program was called Desktop Universe. And uh, DTU um, 
was uh, pretty innovative because it had a real night sky image in it. Uh, so you could actually see the stars as they would appear. And this was because Peter and Doug had done all of those images and incorporated it into the software. So today, some of those assets are in uh, applications like Starry Night uh, that a lot of people know, which also has some Canadian imaging connections. So uh, today, I was happy to get to work and find out from the team that our Maxim uh, software uh, was released. And uh, this is the newest release. We're up to the 23rd version in the version 6 family. Um, and uh, it keeps getting better, whether you're controlling cameras, DSLRs, or uh, just doing image processing. Uh, there's a lot there and a lot to support automation as well. So I don't intend tonight to be a, a commercial. I just thought some of you are, are using the software, so you'd know it. Now, uh, some disruptive things happened starting about six years ago, one of which was the Santa Barbara Instrument Group, which in 2009 had been purchased by a company called Applogen, uh, owned by a Singaporean billionaire, uh, started to rethink what they were doing. And the opportunity came about for diffraction to acquire SBIG. So six, almost seven years ago, uh, SBIG became part of the diffraction family. And uh, subsequently, uh, the uh, new entity, which continues under the diffraction name with SBIG as our camera brand, uh, started introducing a family of new cameras. So uh, a fairly large 16200 camera, um, a new guider for our very largest camera, and a new family of CCD cameras using technology from companies like Sony, Teledyne E2V, um, and on semiconductor, the former Kodak chips. In 2019, we finally saw CCDs start to catch up to CMOS. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But uh, we introduced our uh, Star Chaser uh, CMOS-based guiding camera. And uh, this year, uh, just recently, actually, uh, we've introduced a new line of scientific CMOS cameras. Those that are, you know, large pixels, uh, large format, capable of doing real science work in addition to spectacular imaging. So in about 2015, um, the operation moved into this uh, nice facility up in Ottawa. And uh, that's where most of us uh, would be based, with the exception of myself, who's uh, in the GTA. And... Uh, uh, normally, I would give you the five cent tour, but uh, you'll have to settle for a PowerPoint because of COVID. In any case, uh, there's a few folks that know us, um, both either personally, they own Maxim, they own one of our Boltwood cloud sensors used for closing the observatory roof and keeping things dry and safe. Uh, but you may not know that uh, there are at least two space telescopes that have been tested using some of our technology. Um, there are uh, some things like the 30 meter telescope uh, that's construction, you know, is, is happening on uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, uh, was site surveyed using nine of our cameras. So our SBIG cameras were deployed around the world at the world's best observing sites, and they found that spot on Mauna Kea was the best of the bunch. Um, of course, a few of you might know that the RESC has a remote telescope uh, down in uh, the center of the wildfires in California, and that also uses uh, an SPIG camera, the diffraction supplied uh, uh, at a slightly lower price than retail. In any case, um, so there's some names up there you guys might recognize, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those folks in a little bit. So I mentioned earlier, there's this big disruption with uh, the whole notion of the CMOS technology uh, with active pixel sensors catching up to the passive devices known as CCDs or charge couple devices. And what I found is as I talk to people, there seems to be this notion they have in their heads of it. It's, a, it's like a Rocky Balboa versus, uh, uh, you know, uh, the big Russian guy or something like that. And it's going to be a big knockout. Well, the reality is that it's not about CMOS versus CCD. It's more a case of what can each technology do for you and where are they at in their maturity level and what is new and coming? So I would say it's more about, you know, the technologies uh, and how they come together. Now, to understand how this all fits together, I'm going to draw a couple more Canadian connections for you. Uh, this I'll call my imperfect history of CCDs and CMOS and related technology. 
uh, in, in Japan in about 1956, there was some research into semiconductors that would be able to detect light. Now this is uh, an effect that our good buddy Einstein won his Nobel Prize for. It's known as the photoelectric effect. And they were able to create a semiconductor device that could have a photon of light come in, impact a silicon oxide layer uh, on the semiconductor, and it would kick off an electron and generate a, a positive hole in the uh, circuit. So basically what happens is photon comes in, kicks out that electron, that electron has charge, and then I can measure that charge. Now, a gentleman named Peter Noble that I had the, the honor to speak to a couple months ago um, was a young 25-year-old scientist working for a UK electronics firm called Plessy. And Peter realized that to make this imaging technology possible, you needed to put amplifiers and switching circuitry right at the pixel. And so Peter basically, uh, uh, you know, became a member of the British Empire. He's uh, had all kinds of accolades, no Nobel Prize, mind you, but uh, in, he's the inventor of the active pixel. Um, a few short years later, um, Willard Boyle, who is a Canadian, uh, and George Smith, uh, who are working at Bell Labs, um, uh, basically uh, invented the first CCD device. A CCD device, instead of being an active device, is passive. And what you have are two plates, uh, uh, effectively, one of which uh, stores a positive charge and the other has a, effectively stored a negative charge. And that gap between them uh, causes that charge to stay there. You can then read it out. And the CCD brought a little bit of an innovation, which was you have little buckets, uh, these are the CCD capacitors that are the pixels, and you can pass those pixels uh, charge down a row. So once something starts at one end of the row, um, you clock it out along the row, and then you read it out in the corner. Now in 73, uh, a company called Fairchild Semiconductor started building a 100 pixel by one line CCD sensor. Uh, and uh, this was quickly followed by a 100 pixel by 100 pixel um, uh, sensor, uh, the first kind of pixel array. Meanwhile, in Canada, at the University of Waterloo, uh, Dr. Savas Chamberlain was busy building some image detection technology and later founded a company called DALSA. Now, uh, DALSA, still in Waterloo, uh, in 2011 was bought by a company called Teledyne. And uh, that name will come up again and again as we talk. Um, in the US, we also saw Texas Instruments in the early 70s working on CCDs. And the first one that hit amateur astronomy was the TC211, uh, the 237, and later the 245. Some might know from the cookbook CCD camera. Meanwhile, in England, the English Electronic Valve Company, and a valve for uh, uh, those of us in North America was called a vacuum tube here. Uh, and EEV got bought ultimately by Teledyne. Do you see the theme going on here? So anyway, meanwhile, um, in a funny little film company in Rochester, New York, called Kodak, that also had labs just uh, up Black Creek Drive in, in Toronto, uh, there was a fellow named Steve Sasson who was busy building what became the first digital camera. So yes, back then, Kodak had the first digital camera. And yes, it used one of those Fairchild chips and some Nikon lenses and some technology. And you can see sort of a picture of it in the background there. Uh, it's a thing about the size of a toaster, and uh, it's got about 16 double A's in it. So not exactly portable, and it recorded its data on uh, a little cassette. And then you could take that cassette out and read it uh, and then show the image. His boss saw this and said, well, you know, Steve, this is kind of cool, but I don't think this is ever going to really catch on. And I, I think, well, the rest of us know the story of Kodak. But meanwhile at Kodak, there was a guy named Bruce Bayer who was struggling with the idea of how to replace the uh, tricolor imaging tubes used for television cameras. And he realized that if you had a red filter, two green filters and a blue filter, you could emulate the color response of the human eye. So Bruce uh, invented what became known as the Bayer matrix. And if you've worked with CCDs or CMOS cameras, you might've seen RGGB in a quadrant uh, laying out four little filters over the actual pixels. Kodak went on and did amazing things like built uh, the first digital SLR, 
they bought National Semi's uh, imaging business in 04, and they had been busy building their own CCDs for quite a while and combined those. And eventually they decided, you know, they need money and this imaging CCD stuff's going nowhere. Let's sell it off. Ultimately, that was bought by another company that came out of Motorola called On Semi. So while all this nonsense is going on through the 90s and into the 2000s, a guy named Eric Fossum was challenged uh, by the NASA administrator to find a better, faster, cheaper way of putting an image sensor together. And so Eric took a bunch of technology that existed and said, you know what? If we could use inexpensive uh, microprocessor manufacturing technology, the, the complementary metal oxide semiconductor process that's used for making CPU chips and memories and logic, and apply that to uh, an imaging sensor, we might have uh, something better than the CCD. And of course, you got to keep in mind the timing on Hubble and the Space Telescope, which was launched with CCDs, and where this technology started to head. So Eric gets some credit for inventing some of the first CMOS APS uh, technology. Meanwhile, those folks at uh, HP, you would probably know from uh, laptops and inkjet printers and, and IT services, uh, spun out their test equipment business, spun out their semiconductor business, uh, Micron Technologies bought it. They spun it out. Uh, that Eric Fossum guy started a company called Photobit and on and on and on. And the bottom line is it all ended up getting bought by On Semiconductor again. Sony was in this game as well. Um, G-Pixel was late to the party or based in China, uh, but they've made some really exciting scientific CMOS stuff. And uh, sadly for us and everybody else, uh, On Semi decided on September 18th of last year, they were getting out of the CCD business. They were calling it quits. And so a bunch of folks in Rochester got laid off and that threw a bit of a wrench in our product line and a lot of the other companies that made uh, affordable astronomy cameras. So I'm gonna uh, just cut to the chase on what the difference is between these two technologies. Um, there's two sensors there. Uh, the left one uh, is what you would see in something like a, uh, uh, an SBIG ST7 or uh, an STF402. The right one is something you'd see in one of those uh, little QHY um, sort of security cameras slash webcam slash planetary cameras. Both of them about the same size. Um, but the big difference I've circled there, you can kind of see there's uh, some uh, logic that's uh, uh, embedded at the bottom of the sensor, at the bottom of the blue area there. And uh, this is the big difference. The CCDs really don't have much in the way of logic, uh, circuitry and so on on board. Typically you've got rows going across and uh, each of those rows of pixels come across. The pink ones in my uh, screenshot are the active pixels that light hits. The ones that are sort of gray are masked off. And then you may see a little uh, bump at the end of each row and a silver line running down and out to one of the wires that uh, connects to the outside world. There's about 24 pins on this device. And there's a tiny bit of logic in the corner. It's very, very tiny. If we go look at that uh, equivalent in a uh, CMOS chip, you're gonna see there's a ton of logic. The sensor is surrounded by it on all four sides. The downside of this is that logic generates a lot of heat and that causes glow. And the glow happens all along the edges and the top of the sensor. Um, now, the advantage of the CCD uh, is, is you, know, you don't have that amplifier glow. Uh, the advantage of CMOS is all that logic lets me put the analog to digital converters right on board. And you'll see a lot more gold pins uh, at the edges of the CMOS chip. Anyway, so these changes really uh, uh, have been dramatic in 2019, where CMOS is almost at the level of CCD. And for us, uh, our large camera, which uh, the RESC has one down in California, uh, was our 16803. This had a, uh, uh, that should say Kodak CAF 16803, that's a typo. Um, it's a 4K by 4K array. It's 40 millimeters uh, along each axis. So it's a fairly large sensor. I guess it's about 52 mils on the diagonal. Uh, these cameras have been made in Ottawa for the last six years. And unfortunately, we sold the last one uh, on the 28th of July. 
And so a couple tears were shed. Uh, there are no more of those sensors available anymore. Um, but uh, you can do spectacular things with them. And uh, the good news is, you know, we have uh, new things on the horizon and new things that are already here. So in the center of this next slide, you'll see uh, one of our SBIG Aluma series cameras. These are advanced uh, cameras, a whole new architecture, much faster, much better cooling. And you'll also see uh, it's a little brother uh, to the right, which is our STC-7. That's an all-in-one integrated camera. So the filter wheel and filters uh, are all built into a thin filter wheel on top. Uh, and on the left is the replacement for the STX camera. This is uh, based on a G-Pixel G-Sense 4040. And uh, this, this camera comes in at close to the same price as the CCD. It has some advantages over it, uh, certainly lower noise, uh, but uh, it's 12-bit instead of 16, and it has HDR or high dynamic range mode. So a lot of very different technology. In any case, uh, I might as well show you what one of these things looks like. I uh, just try to click that. So you see the uh, window here, the filters zipping by. And uh, there's a dark filter or an opaque filter in there, which acts as a dark shutter. The CMOS chips don't need to be covered for you to clear out the uh, pixels, uh, but uh, CCDs do. And so the big, even the illumination shutters in large CCD cameras and even the smaller ones take up a fair bit of room. Now, the small guy, we found some ways to miniaturize the whole thing and put it up in this nice little package. And it's, it's about 3,500 US and you can uh, you know, buy it online or from your uh, favorite telescope retailer like Ontario Telescope, for example. So anyway, so uh, I'm gonna just uh, try to move on from there. Oops. So summarize, CCD cools nicely, small number of pins, uh, reads out a little bit slower. The CMOS, ridiculously fast, but a ridiculous amount of complexity. So, you know, I'm not gonna uh, boil the ocean here and spend too much time talking about it, but there's some key things to know. The CCDs, you can bin them, you can build big pixels, you need them for long focal length and you need them for spectroscopy. Uh, you can't bin most CMOS chips. Um, so the tiny pixels they have that are like 4.5 micron and smaller becomes a real problem with long focal lengths. It's great for something um, like a, a Takahashi FSQ or a Red Cat 51 or something like that. But if you've got, you know, a, a large 16 inch or, or 17 inch plane wave, something bigger than that, you have to go CCD for the most part. We've introduced our new Aluma AC4040, which is the first big CMOS chip with decent sized pixels that will apply for those larger things. Uh, so in any case, the one thing that's important to know is that the CCDs, if you've worked with one, you're used to having you know, a zero to 65K range because of the 16 bit A to D converter. Well, that's only 4K uh, with a 12 bit CMOS device. The good news is within uh, probably the next six months, we'll start to see 16-bit capable CMOS that's almost as good as CCD. And one of the downsides of 12-bit versus 16-bit, um, my buddy Richard Wright uh, was talking uh, recently about, and he calls it the $100 problem. And Richard basically says, you know, if all your society has is $100 bills, that's great for paying for a steak dinner or buying appliances, paying your wages, but it's not so great for a can of soda because that means that can of soda is $100 because there is no change. When you apply that to a 12-bit CMOS camera, that each step from zero to 4095 is grouped uh, into you know four bits of what the CCD would have. So you've got 16 times uh, more subtlety in a CCD image. And if your noise is $20 of noise uh, and you've got $25 of signal, well, that's still a $100 quantization problem. So you can't separate them. CCDs that are 16-bit, you don't have that problem. Now, some other factors like linearity, uh, which is if something is twice as bright, like a star that's 
you know, a difference of 1.0 magnitude between two comparable stars, that's two and a half times as bright. In a CCD, that will absolutely come out as two and a half times the count higher. Uh, CMOS wasn't so good. Uh, the current third gen Sony chips and the new GSense 2020 and 4040 are much better. Uh, we've talked about the glow. Uh, we haven't talked about the rest, but I think uh, I would come back and do a CCD versus CMOS talk to drill down. CMOS's clear advantage is speed and also really no, uh, very little noise. I shouldn't say no noise, but very little noise inherent in the detector itself is that logic that's the challenge. So at the end of the day, I've got to ask the question, you know, is, is there a, a winning technology? And really, it's not about CCD versus CMOS. It's really about who you are. I think all of you guys are the winners in this case. It depends on your application. So if you're doing planetary work, you're guiding, you're doing lucky imaging, CMOS's higher frame rate is going to be the advantage there. If you need to bin your pixels together because you're doing photometry, spectroscopy, science applications, then you know what? Your CCD is going to be the winner. Um, when we look at the technology as it exists right now, the state-of-the-art sensors uh, in CMOS technology are almost caught up to where CCD has been for the last five to 10 years. Uh, this is a major step forward, and the costs for the CMOS chips are going to be a lot less. Uh, and, you know, you know that when you, if you look at those, you know, I call them the, the cheap and cheerful cameras, right? The little guys. Um, they're hobby cameras. You can get them fairly inexpensive, and you can be build beautiful images. But at the end of the day, CMOS is finally caught up, but CCD continues to go even further. So... In the meantime, I thought I'd give you just a taste of what I call the specification trap. And that is these beautiful curves that people see. And, you know, if you want to image in hydrogen alpha in the red, that's 600 nanometers thereabouts. Uh, if we look at this uh, QE curve from a typical CCD, we see quantum efficiency at 600 nanometers. Uh, follow the grid, it's about uh, 85%. Fantastic. Now, if we were to say, uh, um, you know, I'll just kind of give you my laser pointer. So we're kind of right here. So about 95% on the CCD chart. Now, if I go over to this beautiful chart from uh, the marketing department at a, uh, another camera company or a sensor company, um, and you will see at 600 nanometers, oh, looks like it's 100%. Gee, the CMOS stuff is great. Well, there's one little scary detail there, and that scary little detail is in here, which is relative sensitivity. So you can see this little word relative. And the question you got to ask yourself is relative to what? So this here, relative sensitivity, a 1.0 is not 100% quantum efficient. You know, 100% quantum efficient is every single photon that comes in knocks loose an electron that you can count. Well, in a relative device, that could be that that's only 40% quantum efficient. Um, in this particular Sony chip, because we've measured it, we know it comes in somewhere around 60%. So from a relative perspective, that CMOS sensor is about here in red, about here in green, and about here in, in blue compared to this particular CCD. The important thing is don't get burned by spec charts. Find out what the actual quantum efficiency is or find a reference point for comparison. The other thing that drives me absolutely nuts and I have to deal with it every single day uh, is frame rate. Now frame rate matters when you're doing certain things like lucky imaging uh, for uh, planets because you're trying to eliminate atmospheric twinkle. Uh, but you'll hear claims like 150 frames per second. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're doing a deep sky image for 20 minutes, um, I don't need 150 frames a second. I need one frame per 20 minute. But if I'm doing guiding, where I might do several updates per second, maybe one update per second, two updates, three updates, you know, I'm still talking three or four frames per second. And of course, exposure time to get a star bright enough on that guide chip it's a factor um, that you have to consider. 
so some of these claims, these manufacturers are, are you know, I'm not, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, they're pulling stuff straight off the data sheet and they're not measuring the real world performance. So if you go take a fast PC and you hook this up and you set the camera in its high resolution mode and test the frame rates, you'll find they're not up to that spec. Those statements are usually the theoretical maximum. So, you know, the other one that drives me nuts is, oh, it's not a USB 3.0 camera or a USB 4.0 camera or Thunderbolt or Firewire or Coax Express or uh, dual fiber channel or what have you. At the end of the day, if the chip can't be clocked out reliably with uh, clean images, it doesn't matter what your interface speed is. And if it's a CCD, USB 2.0 is faster than most CCDs can be read out. So all of these factors go into designing a camera. And so when we do this, we have to think about all these, all these issues because our stuff isn't just used you know, in backyard astronomy, it's being used in all kinds of interesting places. So let me just uh, wrap up uh, by sharing uh, some of what's going on with our customers. So some of you probably are aware there's a big 40, uh, four meter telescope at Kitt Peak in Arizona. And there's a really interesting project going on, uh, which is the, I think it's called the Dark Energy Spectrographic Instrument. And the notion is to uh, basically evaluate the halos around uh, galaxies uh, at far distance out from those halos and to measure the spectra of the starlight. To do this, they need about 45,000 fiber bundles. Yes, that's 45,000 each going to a spectrograph uh, um, grism, I guess it's kind of like a grading and prism together, uh, to a camera. Well, to see if this was going to work, the folks at Ohio State University who are uh, inventing this stuff said, um, hey, have you guys got some affordable cameras that are really precise and good for science, uh, particularly photometry? So we supplied them five of our uh, 6,303 uh, cameras. You'll see them in the center here. There's one in the center, uh, one at the north, south, uh, uh, west, and east. And uh, this device it's all sitting on is about two meters in size, so a little over six feet. Uh, weighs a couple tons, and it basically replaces the secondary mirror on the uh, four-meter Mayel telescope. You can see over here the team is uh, craning this thing into place. The whole assembly uh, basically bolts on over here. And so uh, in June uh, of last year, they let us know uh, that our stuff was working fabulously. We helped them solve some technical issues. And at the end of the day, they were able to prove out that the theory behind DESI was going to work. So, you know, my day job, besides dealing with cameras, I'm helping people who are hunting with dark energy. I think that's cool. So what else are we doing? Well, if we... Uh, move on to our next slide here. Some of you uh, might have heard of the University of Toronto's Dragonfly Array. Now Dragonfly started as uh, a bit of a bet between Roberto Abraham at U of T's Dunlap and Peter Van Dokum at Yale University. And uh, Pete and Bob basically said, what could we do with amateur grade equipment? Like how far could we push the envelope? And so uh, they had this idea that if they got a really good quality uh, amateur mount, like a Paramount uh, ME from Software Bisc, and some common cameras uh, from SBIG in this case, our, our uh, STT 8300s, uh, and some camera lenses with really good coatings uh, and very fast uh, telephoto lenses, uh, and put this together, you could go fairly deep. In fact, you could go all the way down to 24th, 25th magnitude. And nobody really thought of doing this. And so they scaled it up from three to eight to, as you can see, the final configuration here, 24 cameras, 24 um, of those camera lenses. And uh, if memory serves, I believe, uh, there's a fellow on the uh, chat right now uh, who had some input in designing the octagons that mount those lenses. Um, in any case, so this thing has become a game changer for cosmology because they've been able to detect uh, 
galaxies that have extremely low levels of dark matter um, compared to their luminosity. Um, so sort of 99% dark matter free galaxies. They've also discovered the other extreme, which are some that are more uh, dark matter plentiful, very low luminosity galaxies, not a lot of stars generating starlight, but a high concentration of dark matter. Now, of course, this doesn't fit the theory, but uh, in any case, for uh, about $300,000, they were able to do what would take a multi-million dollar, at least meter class telescope to do. So pretty cool stuff. And it's the kind of thing many of you have access to. Uh, just they've scaled it all up. So um, meanwhile, people are always pushing us to innovate. So one of the things that we've done is we've introduced our Star Chaser line of off-axis guiding cameras. So you can see a little pick-off mirror here. The light passes through the center of the opening. The light comes down into the CCD sensor. In this case, it's actually a CMOS sensor. Um, goes to the electronics, and then uh, that goes off to guide your telescope. So you can see the guide port here, power connection, and so on. But while we were at it, we realized that we could take our tip-tilt adaptive optics technology and apply it to small cameras. Uh, so a lot of people, for example, has our STF-8300, or they have uh, the mid-size cameras like the STLs. And so we realized we could basically build a completely independent off-axis guiding camera that could control one of our adaptive optics units. So basically take your star and sharpen it up. So in any case, uh, we could take an old camera uh, in the SBIG family, such as an STL, and either mount the star chaser or a combination of star chaser and AOX adaptive optics to clean it up. And then we said, well, you know, it'd be great if we could offer it for pretty much everything in our lineup. And so, so we did. Um, now, people are always saying, okay, so what's the future, right? Apple now has the new iPad Infinity or whatever the thing came out yesterday. And it has time of flight sensors for LIDAR, distance measuring, um, incredible technology, right? And based on a device called a SPAD, a single photon avalanche diode. Is that coming our way? Well, there's a ton of stuff coming our way. But in our day-to-day, -day, we're seeing the CMOS continue to get better. Um, in the uh, background of uh, this slide here, you can probably see uh, a big vacuum chamber camera. Um, so we're cooling a CCD device down to about minus 70 to minus 90 C, just electrically, uh, without the need for liquid nitrogen. Nobody's really done this uh, before, and uh, so we're kind of pioneering it. Uh, we spent some time talking to the National Research Council guys about their approach to cooling these CCDs. Um, and they were pretty excited by what we're doing. And we were pretty excited to see kind of their version of the state of the art. Now, uh, I'm not going to mention anything about SBIG bringing out uh, a nice big round uh, camera with a really whopping big sensor. I'm not going to mention that. I'm not going to mention the uh, 12 slot, two inch filter wheels or uh, 10 slot, uh, 50 by 50. Uh, square filter wells. I'm not going to mention any of that stuff today. What I thought I'd do instead is give you a peek at some of uh, what people are doing with the uh, CMOS imaging cameras. Uh, Doug George uh, took one home to play with. Uh, so here's, I guess, the uh, Crescent Nambio. Uh, and uh, using the Hubble palettes, uh, this is a quick and dirty version of uh, the veil. It's uh, nice and overhead in Cygnus. Uh, Tony Hallis uh, using a, a Luma 814, I think, which is a very blue sensitive CCD. Uh, Kurt Morton doing some stuff uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, he really takes uh, color imaging to a new extreme. And uh, so some really fantastic stuff going on in this area. And I'm proud to be a part of it. And I certainly appreciate all of my friends in the area C uh, who are also as big and diffraction customers. Uh, thanks to you, you know, we're celebrating 27 years. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions, uh, but uh, thanks everybody. I've enjoyed being here. Colin, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. And, and I trust many of uh, the other folks online enjoyed it as well. Uh, we do have maybe a couple of minutes or, uh, Questions, uh, Blake, over to you. Um, a question from me uh, to you, Colin. Uh, the Maxim DL software appears to 
have a focusing, a very good focusing routine in it. And I was just wondering if that is a, available as a standalone tool or do you, you have to get Maxim to get that uh, great focusing? Well, um, the focusing capability in Maxim is an automated focus routine. Um, you know, it's uh, obviously I would love for you to buy a Maxim DL Pro because it has pretty much everything. Uh, but if you look at other tools, the other one that works well um, uh, that I like is uh, uh, the current version of Focus Max. Uh, and Focus Max can actually control a camera through Maxim. So if you just need focusing, you know, Focus Max is a great option. Um, but uh, if you're trying to do uh, uh, more sophisticated things, then Maxim is totally the way to go. Um, and just thinking about Maxim, uh, one of the cool things that's sort of a side effect of us thinking about uh, Dragonfly and what's next for Dragonfly is we've just introduced something called Maxim Maestro. And the idea is like an orchestra conductor where uh, somebody is leading the orchestra um, and keeping everybody in time. Maxim Maestro will allow multiple imaging cameras to be used simultaneously. So you could, for example, have a wide field DSLR um, taking short images while you're doing something deep sky. Um, so your main camera might be a CCD and uh, you could have a second camera that's uh, a DSLR. Or if you've got lots of money uh, or you're like Dragonfly, you could do simultaneous imaging. And one of the scenarios there is image uh, the Hubble palette all at once. So the slowest camera will be the one with the sulfur two because that's the least amount of light. Uh, H alpha will be next and O3 uh, will be the brightest. So you could have three cameras all clicking off and the maestro will lead the sequence of those three players. Um, so it's kind of a neat technology. Um, it, it uses some web services and some other technology that's uh, much more common, but um, it's sort of new for us trying to bring some of those high-end multi-imager capabilities um, to the amateur world. Um, you know, it's not without its uh, bumps getting it all going, but uh, it's pretty cool stuff. And so, you know, Maxim's been around for a long time, but uh, we keep innovating. Uh, we write, rewrite parts of it. Uh, it's, you know, moving to 64 bit, I think is next on the list to handle these huge cameras. So a lot of good stuff going on. Thanks for the question, Paul. Okay. All right, more, uh, Blake, anything else? Uh, one more quick question. Um, you, I think you did talk about sort of some of the future but maybe um, a bit of a focus question. Do, uh, where do you think in five years, CCD and CMOS sensors will be? So last time I, I was asked that, I was proven incredibly wrong. Um, basically, uh, the CMOS technology has caught up two years ahead of what I estimated. And uh, so I'm embarrassed to say uh, predicting the future is one of my strengths. That said, uh, uh, Doug and I meet with all of the leading companies that are manufacturing these devices. We know what's on their future roadmap. Um, there's an innovation that was, uh, I'm going to give you guys a scoop on it. Uh, so uh, this info came out yesterday and it'll probably hit uh, the news uh, today, tomorrow kind of thing. So the G-Pixel guys have basically built a CMOS sensor. It's 4K by 4K, just like the, the classic Kodak STX uh, or uh, CAF 16803 sensor, 16801. Well, we had said to them months ago, you guys need to make it back illuminated. In other words, you take the chip you flip it over so the logic is on the back side and you polish down the underside of the chip to let the photons through to the pixels. Backside illumination is a technology that was developed first in CCDs and uh, Teledyne are the experts at it. Uh, and their stuff is used in all the big observatories. Well, G-Pixel um, and Sony both have BSI technology, but G-Pixel has now announced it for their 4040 uh, sensor. So you can imagine if you, if you can afford, uh, I don't know, a Toyota Camry, you can probably afford one of their chips. Uh, they're a bit pricey. 
but these things are in the 90 percentile for quantum efficiency. And um, they also go a little bit further into the UV, a little bit more toward the infrared. Uh, and this is the sort of thing where a club or a group of amateurs could get access to this technology. And we will be shipping a camera, as I say, uh, a little bit later this year, probably January. But uh, most of the design work's already done. So you guys are getting a bit of a scoop. The CCD stuff, we're seeing uh, what's called deep depletion silicon. And this basically gets the impurities out of the silicon. It's a much thicker uh, wafer they use. Uh, the process involves uh, growing that crystal to a high level of purity, uh, slicing it thicker and so on. The advantage is much lower noise, much greater uh, quantum efficiency, um, but you have to cool this thing like crazy. And that's why things like the vacuum camera are coming. So the main thing to understand though, is a lot of this technology is driven by consumer electronics, right? Apple is producing millions of uh, iPhones and iPads every month, you know, or probably every week if, uh, if we think about these new products they're announcing. That drives the cost down substantially. Now, when you look at the total astronomy market, right? So if every astronomer in North America uh, could buy a CCD or a CMOS device, in Canada, we have about 500 professionals, about 5,000 RASP members, so 5,500. In the US, it's about 10x that. So there's about 50,000 professionals. Um, the amateur ratio is lower in the US, uh, but say there's 100,000 all in, right? So we're just a drop in the bucket compared to the number of sensors that are gonna be installed in smartphones, tablets, and other consumer devices. As well, the machine vision stuff is driving the high frame rates. So just about every camera uh, or every car has a backup camera, but now it's got lane departure alert. And up, you know, by your rear view mirror up top, you've got a little camera pointing in front or a pair of them for stereo vision for the onboard computer. So this is driving cost way down. So CMOS is gonna get cheaper and cheaper. CCD is gonna get more niche but better and better in those niches. And some of that cost will come down. So that, that point we're gonna cross, I think is gonna happen within the next 18 to 24 months, probably faster. There's new technologies coming and the uh, ADC bit depth, the quantum efficiency and so on is coming up on CMOS and we're starting to see some bigger pixels. But you know, I, I've got a camera that's got 24 micron pixels um, that's based on a Teledyne device. Um, there's a 13 micron pixel there. In the CMOS, the biggest gets up to maybe six micron uh, to nine micron. So, uh, you know, if you think about NASA's New Horizons probe that was designed several years ago and is out past Pluto right now, um, it's got a Teledyne 4720 chip in it. Our little blue Aluma cameras uh, include a 4710 in that lineup. That chip is stupendous. It's like 93 to 90%, 98% quantum efficiency. Yeah, it's a $13,000 camera, but it's stunning what it can do on a long focal length telescope very quickly. Um, so life is just gonna get better. I think, you know, that's, that's the end of the day. It's gonna get better for us. Uh, I think there will be some new technologies like SPADs will get be, uh, to a size where they're big enough to be used for astronomy. And there's some cool quantum dot technology uh, that's going to let us see better in the infrared. So good stuff coming, and there'll be stuff out of left field that I can't even predict. Great question. Thanks. Very good. Uh, thank you so much uh, again, Colin, uh, for the insight. Um, we're running a little bit behind, so we need to move on to our next speaker, and that's Arushi Nath, and she'll talk to us about how she completed her RESC Explore the Universe certificate. Go ahead, Arushi. So, hello everyone. I'm Arushi, a grade six student from Toronto, Canada. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about my travels around the universe in six years to complete the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Explore the Universe Certificate. So, I started like anyone, all kids. The first thing I learned about astronomy was the nursery rhyme Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And sometimes my school teachers used to tell me some facts, like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And they told me that 
the moon has different phases. Sometimes you can see the whole moon in the sky. Sometimes you cannot see the moon in the sky. But they never told details about each of these facts. And as I became older, I started asking myself questions. Like I knew the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, but I didn't actually know what the east and west were. So the first step towards astronomy I did is to make a compass and I put it on my balcony. Then I tried to find some landmarks for each direction. For the south, it was easy. As my balcony was facing Lake Ontario, I knew that would always be the south. Then, if it's in the morning when I'm gonna getting ready to go to the school bus, I know that if, wherever the sun is, it's around the east. And in the evening time, wherever the sun is, it's around the west. So doing this was very fun and it trusts me a lot. So I decided to continue doing this and observe at night as well. So the first thing I learned about was constellations. The first one I learned actually was the Big Dipper and the Cygnus the Swan. Now I found out that knowing which direction was which was very useful because if it said a constellation is in the north, I knew exactly where to look. So this was around the time where I heard about the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I heard that they were hosting free events on astronomy for anyone to come to. So I decided to go there. So me, my dad took me to the vast Bayview Village Park, where I remember a field with many telescopes. I was allowed to look at whichever telescopes I wanted to. Lots of people threw their telescopes on planets. I remember that that was the first time that I saw Saturn and its rings. I also learned about lots of rhymes that I could use to do constellation hopping, like Arc to Arcturus, which links the Arc of the Big Dipper to the star Arcturus. I was very fascinated at that point, and I started to go to as many events as possible. One of the others I went to was the Ontario Science Centre, where I listened at monthly meetings on astronomy. There, people shared the Sky to Month presentations or their own journey, like watching solar eclipses or making their own telescopes. In addition, I went to the David Dunlop Observatory where I looked at a telescope, which was several times my size. In the eyepiece, I saw many globular clusters. Actually, I found myself wondering a lot, what would have happened if the Earth was inside a globular cluster? In addition, I went to some lectures on astronomy near my house. I don't remember too much about the lectures, but I remember that's the first time I heard about a star finder. I found out that star finders I used to find where constellations are in the sky. This was very useful for me because in, this, in, the, city light, in the city, there were lots of lights, so I couldn't always see too many stars. Now, we're coming to my favorite part, the Kaur Astronomical Observatory. This was very, this was actually a great experience for me because at first I got to do camping and see rocket launches. Then I could look into the telescope to look at sky objects. And I could actually look at sky objects much earlier than in the city because there were less lights around, which permitted me to do many, much more observations. And this is actually where I found out about the Explore the Universe certificate. I wanted to try it out because it would be a great way to find out which sky objects to look at at night. So actually you can see an example of one of them here. And looking at all these, doing all these RASC activities actually changed myself. It made me to me who I am today. Now, I am much more observant and looking at the night sky. 
And actually, like Devask keeps me updated on latest events. For example, the recent one I heard was that um, actually they found that there was fo um, phosphine in the atmospheres of Venus. So this way I can keep up with the latest news. And while I was observing, I found out that the universe is actually never still. It keeps on moving. So if we just glance outside and then come back, I would not be able to see any changes. But if I looked for a longer time, I'd be able to see more changes. Same thing for the Earth. You cannot see changes right away, but if you look for some time, you can see the cars moving or the streetcars moving. So I wanted to know what kind of, what other changes were there be in the sky? So I wanted to first find out if very quickly there was any changes in only a matter of minutes. This I found out could be, me could be measured using the movement of the sun's shadow. To measure it, I went in my balcony and I made a sundial using a pencil and kept in the sun. There, I could see the shadow of the pencil. But if I waited for a couple minutes, I'd be able to see the shadow slowly moving. I made some calculations and I found out that the shadow moves um, 15 degrees every hour. That would make sense because that would mean that in 24 hours, it would move 360 degrees, which is correct. Then I wanted to find out some changes happening a bit slower, like every hour. This, for this, I looked at the moon. This is how the moon moves from one part of the sky to the other. So to see the change, I took a landmark, in this case, the CN Tower. And before dinner, I looked at where the moon is. Then after I finished my dinner, I looked at the moon again, and I found out that had it had gone to the complete other side of the CN Tower and it had gone much higher. Next, for cycles in a daytime, I looked at the moon again, but this time it was the phases. I looked at the changes in phases of the moon, but if I looked right away, I wouldn't be able to see anything. That's why it requires some days. So it could go from full moon to new moon or new moon to full moon. And actually the new moon is actually this night. So it is clear, the sky is gonna be very dark tonight. And I want to find out something happening in a much bigger time, in this case, the weeks. So this would be two different objects in the sky coming closer together or going farther together. In this case, I took the moon and Mars as an example. In the first figure, you can see that the moon is much farther to, than the Mars. And it looks like the Mars is losing the race against the moon. But if I look at in just eight days, I'd be able to see that the Mars has overtaken the moon by a lot. And finally, if I want to see changes happening in a very big time, changes happening every month, I can look at new constellations coming in the night sky. For example, right now, I'm able to see the summer triangle made up of three stars, Deneb, Vega, and Alder. That is because this is the summer. But when I'm able to see Orion the hunter in the sky, I would know that winter is coming because Orion is a winter constellation. So I enjoyed taking all these observations every night, but I was still not satisfied. It seemed that there was something else I could do related to space. And as I believe the best way to learn fully about a subject is to make a project about it. I thought, why not merge all of my projects with space? So since then, all my projects are related to space. For example, 
when I went to watch a solar eclipse, I made an instrument to measure the changes happening during the solar eclipse, like the brightness. And I also started attending space-related hackathons, like the NASA Space Apps Challenge. There, I submitted my project, Yes, I Can, which takes images from the Canadian satellite, in this case, the map of Canada, and turns it into the 150 logo of Canada, or the Canada flag. And after all this, and as I believe the best way to fully finish a project is that you tell it to people, present it so that anyone can understand it. So, and as I was looking at the RASC Recreational Astronomy Night every month, I thought, why not make my own presentations there? So since then, this is actually my 12th presentation, but it's my first solo presentation because the rest I've been doing with my brother. I did more outreach about my present about my projects because I wanted all other kids to be more interested in space. As I'm in, as I'm bilingual and speak English and français, I decided to make outreach in English and French. So, yes, and I actually won some awards in the process, and some of my projects got posted in some newsletters. But after this, all of the six years, I finished the Explore the Universe certificate. The journey was very fun, but it's not the end. It's just the beginning. I am planning on going to the moon next. I've already started taking observations to fill up the master certificate. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Arushi. Uh, that's a great, great start. And uh, congratulations on your accomplishments. And I'm glad to see that you're keeping all your observations uh, in a notebook. Keep that up. Um, so in the interest of time, uh, Rushi, we're going to have to skip questions. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we'll have to move on to our next speaker. And uh, that's Joel. He'll tell us about uh, some uh, astronomy book suggestions. Go ahead, uh, Joel. Oh, thank you. All right. So my talk is 30 popular astronomy book recommendations from my library. I figured that because of COVID and we're doing this remote, uh, I would invite you into my house and you can see this is just one of my many bookshelves behind me. Um, and over there, I've organized all my astronomy books, actually not all of them, just um, most of them. And I'd like to show you some of my favorite recommendations. Uh, just as an introduction, I'm one of my passions is nonfiction books. I run a Facebook group. We have over 6,500 members now. So if you are active on Facebook, be sure to check it out. Facebook.com backslash groups, serious nonfiction, all one word. Um, there are some questions you can answer to enter the group. And uh, you can see there's some lively discussion going on there. For this talk, the target audience for my books is going to be beginner and amateur books. Most popular books are written for such an audience, um, focusing on history, biography, basic science. Uh, I'm trying to stay away from those specialized books, books about astrophotography or some sky atlases, you know, 50 objects you can find in the sky. Um, um, maybe because that's a little bit more for an advanced audience. Uh, so for the audience tonight, uh, you might find this a little basic or you might find it interesting, the historical uh, or the science angle of it. Um, and I've rated these books for accessibility and engaging writing style. So anything that's too technical, I've tried to stay away from. So these books are all very, very approachable. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I've got another camera set up here and I'm going to, to uh, switch the view and show you. On my other camera, camera. Let's Let's get, a little, get a little closer. This camera can show you a little bit of the bookshelf. So I can... The first, uh... can everybody see there? Yeah. So the first books I'm uh, going to show you, actually, this is, uh, is the only fiction book on this list, is The Martian. A lot of you might know the, the film that came out a few years ago with Matt Damon. Uh, this book is really, really great. Uh, you can see I've got two editions for it. There's actually a, this one over here is a classroom edition, 
what they've done is, is they've uh, um, cleaned it up a little bit. There's, there's a little bit of the language because this book proved to be such a popular book for uh, teaching kids science. The, the, the attention to the science in these books is really, really um, high attention to the scientific detail. Um, so that's a fun book for, to, for, to give to kids to read. I gave it to my daughter and she read it and then I let her watch the movie and it really is a great book for sparking interest uh, for kids. So that's why I've included this book in here, even though it's a fiction book, but it's a great introduction to science. Um, and because now you can see Mars so bright in the sky, uh, next time you have a chance, look up at Mars and you might find some of those geographic features that the book talks about. So. Uh, the next section of books that I'm going to focus on are books which are sort of introductions to observing. Um, the first book on my list is The Stars by H.A. Ray. H.A. Ray, you might recognize, is the author of the Curious George series. And this book is a book he wrote about astronomy, but it's got that same, uh, that same style of illustration. You can see he's got, those are the different constellations he tries to teach it to you by, by um, uh, he he changes the from the old way of looking at the constellations to a new way, which helps you imagine it a little bit better. And it's got some really nice, witty comics in here. There's a little um, kangaroo down in Australia saying, uh, the Dipper, never seen it. Um, and the middle section of the book has got uh, sky charts. And the last section of the book uh, even tries to explain to you exactly. This is, I, I really like this illustration. It really helps you picture Where's east? Where's west? How are we turning relative to the sky? So it's it's an old book. This is probably 50 years old. It's come out in several editions, uh, but it's a re it's a really good introduction to to observing. Uh, the next book on my list. Let's go through the slide. Next slide here uh, is Night Watch. I don't own a copy of this book. I got this from the Toronto Public Library. This is by the Canadian. I think he um, is probably an emeritus member of the RASC, uh, Terence Dickinson. This book is really great. It's got uh, really comprehensive. It's got everything from observing techniques and what equipment to use and where to look, everything you need to get started with uh, stargazing and observing. And it's spiral bound, so you can take it out with you uh, in the field and, it, and it'll, it'll last. Uh, likewise, there's another one here. This one I haven't read, but this one's been recommended to me. It's called Turn Left at Orion, also spiral bound. You can take it out into the field. Uh, and it's sort of a guide to the sky, which what, how the sky will look, out, look at different different seasons and what to look for and how to find your way. How to... And of course, uh, next slide here, I'll, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Observer's Handbook. Now, this is not really a book you can read from beginning to end. It's very detailed. It's got lots of great reference material. Um, anybody who's a member of the RASC uh, receives one of these, and this is a good reference manual. Um, and Finally, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole bunch of books you can get on astrophotography, a whole bunch of books that will give you different ideas to look for, um, things to look for in the sky, things to photograph in the sky. Um, I don't actually own any of these because I find most of this information I can find online. Um, and it's harder to find these books at discount prices. Most of these books I like to buy at discount. Uh, so some of these more technical or, or um, um, specialized guides is a little harder to, to, to find. Uh, but there's 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 lots of great ones out there. Uh, the next section is general history. So this is uh, one of my favorites. Um, my favorite one here is Bill Bryson. Some of you might know this. Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. If you haven't read this book, I highly, highly recommend it. And this is the special illustrated edition. It's got a beautiful, beautifully illustrated, um, full color, Full color illustrations here. This is just some of the chapter titles. Uh, it covers all areas of science. Uh, astronomy is really covered more towards the beginning. There you got that. Uh, who was that? Wilson and Penzias. I think this is a famous photograph of them at their observatory. Um, but it's it's the, this uh, this is Percival Lowell at his telescope. But it's fully illustrated this edition. If you if you're going to get it. See if you can find this one, it might be a little pricey. Um, um, but if you can't find the illustrated edition, it's a great book. He's very, very, very funny. And uh, what's nice about him is he's a trained journalist. He's not a scientist at all. So his writing style is more focused. He writes like a journalist. So it, write, it read, really 
really, really well. But um, impressively, as a journalist, he really spent a lot of time researching the science, and he got lots of, and he got he got the science mostly right, which I'm very, very impressed by. Uh, the next book in general history um, is a very well known one. This is Timothy Ferris, Coming of Age in the Milky Way. Uh, this is a full history. This is one of the best books I found on the history of uh, of uh, astronomy and man's understanding of his place in the universe going all the way back from the ancient Greeks all the way up to the 20th century and there's a big focus on the 20th century so he goes through all the major all the major breakthroughs um, it's a couple of decades old so it's a little bit out of date um, but it still holds up really well in terms of a general history book on on the history of astronomy it's still one of the best ones out there in the market um, Timothy Ferris has actually got a whole bunch of books on astronomy. This is one of the topics he likes to write about. Um, I've listed some on the slide over here. It's not that Timothy Ferris. If you Google Timothy Ferris, you're more likely to get the Timothy Ferris who writes a bunch of business self-help books. That's Timothy Ferris with two S's. Uh, the Timothy Ferris that's a science writer is with one S. And this is just some of his books. Um, this book I really like, um, it's called Seeing in the Dark. And members of our club might really like this because it's really about how Backyard stargazers are probing deep space and guarding Earth from interplanetary peril. So he's got chapters here on people that look for look for um, comets, um, and it really shows you about. He's got interviews with with some of these amateur astronomers and showing you how some of the contributions that amateur astronomers made, like the Halley Bopp um, comet, for example. He has an interview with them, and he shows you how much contribution amateur astronomers uh, actually make. To, to the field. So that's really great um, for our group. Um, going back to, yeah, so I said Timothy Ferris is really good. If you want something a little bit more up to date um, and a little bit more approachable style, this is Simon Singh's Big, Big Bang, also focuses on 20th century um, Hubble and our understanding of the, 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 um, the Big Bang and the size of the universe, the age of the universe and all that. Um, this is a really good book. Simon Singh is a really good, he's a really funny, easy author. He's even, uh, I'll, in the next slide here, he's got a whole bunch of other books, mainly focusing on math. He's even appeared on the Number File uh, channel on YouTube. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with the Number File channel on YouTube, definitely check that out. Simon Singh is on there and he's really, um, uh, he's really into the science out, um, math outreach. Um, uh, he's even got a book about the Simpsons and math. So you can see what type of guy he's, he's, he's uh, somewhat humorous too. So um, that's, that's a, a good approachable one. It's sort of comparable to the Timothy Ferris one. Um, there's a couple of others. Uh, there's um, Arthur Kessler, The Sleepwalkers is a very famous one. This is from 1959. So this is a classic. Arthur Kessler is a well-known uh, novelist, um, more of the literary type. So he's, He's, uh, this book is, is a little bit more uh, philosophical, say. Um, it doesn't focus so much more on the modern period. It focuses more on the ancient period. Um, but that's a, that's a classic, so I've included that one. Um, as well, um, Daniel Bor uh, Borston, uh, not so much on astronomy, really. I've included this one also because it's somewhat of a classic, uh, published um, a good 40 year, uh, almost 40 years ago. Um, but he talks about really the entire human understanding of our place in the universe and economics and biology and all that um, and how the different religions played a role. So um, Islam and Christianity and the interface between the two. So it's really much more wide ranging than just astronomy, but I've included it in the list because in the first few chapters, he does talk about uh, how that sort of impacted men's understanding of their place in the universe. Um, the next section of the uh, of my recommendations is what I call tour of the universe. So this is sort of going in the Carl Sagan style, where you start on Earth and you start on a, on a journey through the solar system and then to galaxies and the Big Bang, and then it starts getting wider. So um, obviously, the first uh, the first book on that recommendation list is Carl Sagan's Cosmos. Again, this is I, this is based on a he's he had a TV series uh, which is very famous, and this is the book that sort of came out at the same time. And this edition of the book is also a illustrated edition of the book. So he's got beautiful pictures. I mean, this is a picture imagining what living on a planet 
which would be in the solar system instead of the sun, you'd have you'd be living with the ring nebula as the sun of your system. Um, and the and the book is is likewise full of full of um, you know full color illustrations. This is the famous uh, moonshine uh, photograph taken from the moon, um, or not moonshine, the sunshine, uh, Earth shine. That's the name of the photograph. So this book is if you are going to get the Carl Sagan, this is the illustrated edition, and he's got likewise. Um, Comet, which is another book he wrote with his, um, then became his wife as Andrew, and I think she also produced the show, and it has the same thing. It's full of these nice, beautiful color color uh, illustrations. I find uh, Carl Sagan uh, somewhat contemplative at times. He gets a little bit um, philosophical, uh, but he's fun. He's nice, to, he's, he's nice to listen to, and he's got many, many other books. Um, these are just two of them, but uh, another couple I have here is Billions and billions and shadows of forgotten ancestors, and he's got many, many, many more. Um, and so I'd recommend checking him out if you like his style. In a similar style as Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, I don't think he comes to the level of of, uh, of Carl Sagan, in my opinion. Um, but he's a great voice to listen to. So this is a recent book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. A lot of people might have heard of this book. Uh, I found a audio version on YouTube, so you can listen to him talk about it and he follows the same style as saying and he goes talks about the earth and the atmosphere of venus and then on and on to mars and jupiter and then galaxies and then he talks about time travel and inter uh ufos and 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 extraterrestrial life and all that um another book in that uh, which i'm going to get to later is um uh, the planets by david sobel but i put that i grouped that with a bunch of other books in her so i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about that later but she's a similar style to that uh the next group of books um, is relativity, big bang, theory of everything, string theory. There's, this is a very popular genre of books. Uh, perhaps the most uh, popular is Brian Greene, but the one I started with here is one, two, three, infinity. This is a classic. I really, really recommend this book. It's really fun read. Um, he's got great little illustrations there, really funny illustrations. And he explains some of these concepts. Like here he is explaining Minkowski space. Um, which is based on Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, here he explains the the um, what was it the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. But he explains these things in a way which is so stupidly simple uh, that it's just amazing. You feel like you're you're sitting in a in a lecture um, of one of the greats, one of the great scientists, uh, sort of like the Richard Feynman, where he explains some things and it's so simple um, and it's so much fun to read. Uh, the classic book in this genre is uh, the illustrated Brief History of Time. This is, again, an illustrated edition. This is a um, two-in-one illustrated Brief History of Time and Universe in a Nutshell. This came out in the 90s, so it is it is a classic, um, and it's got some cheesy 90s computer graphic style illustrations. Um, it does feel somewhat uh, dated at time. Here he's got a picture of a star revolving around a black hole creating x-rays because of the revolving um, ions and so on. Um, yeah, it is, it, it, it is a little cheesy, the illustrations, and um, it does feel a little, a little dated, um, but it's nice to hear Stephen Hawkins himself explain Hawking radiation and black holes, things that you know that he was on the forefront, um, and he's got a bit of the history behind that too, he talks about. So that's a, that's, that's a, um, a book. I read it once when I was one of the first books I read when I was 13 years old, and I read it again a, a few years ago. Uh, I think it had a bigger impact on me when I was 13. Um, I think since then there's been many other books that sort of have superseded it, but it's a it's, it's a great classic. Um, and he's got a whole bunch of other books as well, um, which I've included in this, The Universe in a Nutshell, um, which is included in this volume. He's got one called uh, The Grand Design, which he wrote together with Leonard um, Mladenow and um, and um, some other some other books. Um, and then I also mentioned the books by Brian Greene. Uh, he's probably one of the most popular. He writes about string theory and M theory. Um, I don't know if I'd call that astronomy so much. Uh, most of it is more the math or the physics behind it. Um, but I would have to include it in this same um, genre of, of, of books. And there's a whole bunch of the other ones. Sean Carroll is another author who is um, who's very well known. Uh, the, particle at the end of the universe. Um, I haven't read his books, uh, but he's one of the most popular in this genre. And then in the next slide uh, here, 
is Michio Kaku. He's another great author. Um, he writes uh, uh, about parallel universes and hyperspace and multidimensional space, physics of the future. He's got a whole bunch of books about sort of that that more um, futuristic type of, of um, time travel and, and, and that type of physics. And I've lumped all these together in one, but there's a whole bunch of those that talk about, a whole bunch of authors, Kip Thorne. Um, I've got a book here about, which is based on the movie, the Interstellar movie. I have to buy this one again, because it's got beautiful illustrations. Um, so, you know, these are the images from the movie that, that was computer simulated, the black hole, what it would have looked like. And he explains the science behind it and how and how 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 much research he put into actually he was the scientific consultant on that movie and this book explains a lot of that um, but he writes a lot about uh, black holes and, and all that um, but there's many other authors Stephen Weinberg is a popular one the book uh, um, the first three minutes is a classic I think it's written back in the 70s um, and then you've got some other ones Lee Small and Max Tegmark uh, Martin Rees David Deutsch you can you can check these out these are there's there's many, many such such books. Um, but again, I wouldn't consider them astronomy per se. Uh, these are more relativity, age of the universe, big, big bang and things like that. Um, next little section here is origin of life and exoplanets. Um, I've included this because this is interesting. Uh, this is a book that was recommended to me. I don't own the book, uh, so you'll have to look at it on the slide, but this is a book that was recommended to me by Ian Shelton. Some of you might know him. Yeah, I think he's a, a RAS member. He gave a course at UT when I was there about life on other planets. Um, and this was a book that he recommended to me. The textbook of that course was uh, the was called Life in the Universe by Bennett and Show, Showstack. Uh, but this is interesting. It shows the origins of the different elements, how they came to Earth, and whether or not other planets can have can have life. Um, that, that's a nice uh, that's a nice recommendation there. Uh, and uh, along similar lines is uh, Neil Shubin. This is his second book. His first book is Your Inner Fish about um, evolution. Um, and he's a paleontologist. This is not astronomy. It's just the first chapter or the first couple of chapters talks about um, the early, early age of the earth and how life arose on earth. So I've included it in this section here. Um, but there's a bunch of books sort of in the same, in the same topic, which crosses between biology and um, exobiology and astronomy, which is interesting for if you're interested in that. These are a couple of books that you can read in that in that genre. Uh, the next section, I've already gone through some history, but the next section is like specific history and, and biography. The books I recommended earlier were general history about the Big Bang and Copernicus and our man's understanding of their place in the universe. But I've got a whole bunch of recommendations here about books about specific uh, episodes in history. Um, and one of the best authors in that is David Sobel. So, uh, this book here is called Longitude. If you, if you could, if you, again, this is highly, highly recommended. This is the illustrated edition. You don't need to read the illustrated edition, uh, but it's the story of John Harrison and, and how he invented the marine chronometer to solve the longitude problem for uh, people finding their place at sea. And this is, it's got pictures. This is, this is finally, I mean, she shows here. Let's see if I can find it. This was his first marine chronometer, big, big machine with those, uh, springs over here uh, to try to solve the, the problem of the of the of the ship uh, swaying from side to side until finally uh, he was able to make it accurate enough by shrinking it down to size. Uh, so this is this is a great book. Uh, she explains she explains it really really well. She tells the story really really well. And I would highly recommend the TV series. There's a two part mini series uh, put out by A and E, the television channel A and E. Um, you can find it on Amazon Prime, I think, but that television series, I really, really recommend the costumes, the music. Uh, it, it's a period piece um, that's really, really puts you in a place and really helps you understand the characters and it features, you know, King George uh, and, oh, and, and Neville Mac, um, Mac, um, Masculine and all these 18th century, uh, 18th century costumes and characters. Really, really highly recommend the TV series, uh, even more than the book, I, I, I would say, unless you want the concepts to be explained to you a little bit more. Uh, and she's got a whole bunch of other books. Um, Galileo's Daughter, some of her books focus on, on women in astronomy. So Galileo's Daughter. Uh, this one here, The Glass Universe. Uh, and this is my Lego set of famous uh, of women of NASA. So I, I, this came out as a special edition a few years ago. You've got Margaret Hamilton, Sally Ride, Mae Jensen, and Nancy Roman. I keep that on my shelf. Um, but Deva Sobel, uh, this is the story of the women who at Harvard I think Chris in her in his presentation spoke about 
um, the, 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 the Cepheids. And that was uh, work that was done by, um, uh, I think this, this shows you here, uh, her name was Anne, uh, who was it, Anne, um, this is her, there it is, Anne Cannon and her telescope. And she meticulously labeled all the photographic plates and she was able to figure out the different classes of stars and through that was able to figure out how quickly they were receding and that led to Hubble's um, great discovery. Um, so this is this is a great book if you want to read about women in astronomy. Um, and this is another one about uh, Copernicus. And in the middle section of this book, it's called a more a more perfect heaven, about um, about uh, how Copernicus. This is a biography. And the interesting thing about this is that the middle section is written as a uh, play, um, which is a conversation uh, of Copernicus. Um, so that that's interesting. Um, another book I have here on the slide, I don't own this book, I haven't read this book, but this was recommended to me, it's called The Measure of All Things. It's the story of how they measured, these two French scientists were sent on a mission to measure the meridian um, in order to establish the metric system to figure out exactly how big a meter was because it was defined in terms of the meridian which ran through Paris. So this is an interesting book also, uh, features Cassini and some of the fa famous names from, from, from that. From that. 18th century uh, period. Um, so I put that along. I think it goes together nicely with, with David Sobel's books. Um, here's another one from a more modern period. This is uh, Walter Lewin's books called For the Love of Physics. Now he's a scientist. This is uh, full of stories, personal stories. The book starts off sort of as an introduction to some basic science um, concepts because he's famous for giving some series of uh, physics lectures on YouTube where he does some crazy antics. But the book really gives his passion for science and doing science professionally. Um, there's some pictures here in the middle. Um, and he's, he's famous for sending these balloons up and discovering some x-ray sources. So he really explains, I showed you that picture earlier of uh, in the Hawkins book of the star revolving around the black hole. He actually figured out, he found some of the x-ray sources for this by sending up some of these balloons. And the book is full of stories. And he actually talks about meeting some of the great the great astronomers. Um, and it, this book really conveys his passion for science. And he has a whole chapter here where he talks about science and art and how important art is uh, to him. Uh, so this is a really great book. It's a really personal, personal story, which really conveys his passion for science. Um, uh, next on the list is, is a book called, I don't have it here. It's called uh, Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos by Dennis Overby. Uh, he was a editor or a writer for the Sky and Telescope magazine, I believe. Uh, he's a really good writer. And this is also a very personal story about the, the members of the, the Palomar Observatory and how they measure the age of the universe. And he focuses on, on a few key characters, which are a little uh, less known. Alan Sandage is one of the, the characters he features. Uh, I think he's a lot uh, in the style of, if you've read James Gleick's books, he has a book, Chaos, where he really... Uh, delves into the biographies of the characters involved. Uh, so he's he's a good writer, and this is a good story, uh, a very focused story um, about that period. Uh, next on my list is American Eclipse. This I also don't own. I got this from the Toronto Public Library. This book came out just in time for the uh, the 2017 eclipse a couple of years ago. He came out with this book a couple of months before it to capitalize on that. And this is the story of the 18. 78 Great American Eclipse. And there's another one coming up in 2024. Don't miss that one. But this one passed through the American, the Wild West. And this is the story of Thomas Edison, among other um, scientists in the 1800s, when the West had was, was still a wild country, they made a trip out there to observe, uh, to make some key observations. One of the things they were looking for was the planet Vulcan, which you can read about in my next book which is called The Hunt for Vulcan. This is a, the story of how Albert Einstein's theories um, destroyed a, a theory which was popular for uh, a, a bit of time uh, that, was, that was hypothesized by uh, uh, Le Verrier, who was the discoverer of Uranus, put forth a theory of the, um, the uh, I got the bookmark here. This is, he shows the, the perihelion of Mercury 
shifting over uh, over over time, which wasn't explainable with Newton's law. So Leverrier put a, put forth a theory that there was actually another planet, but nobody could observe the planet because the sun was in the way. Um, it was supposed to be very very close to the sun, and that's why they made these trips out to these eclipses. Uh, and he's got the story of the of the the, the nineteen nineteen eclipse of Arthur Eddington, which is also covered. Let me go to the next book. Um, is the biography of Walter Isaacson of, of Einstein. Again, this is not an astronomy book, uh, but he does cover the stories of the 1914, the aborted mission in the 1914 to make that observation, and the 1919 uh, um, expedition to the eclipse in, was it Madagascar, where they actually confirmed Einstein's theories. Um, so that brings us to the end of our list. Um, and in my slides, I've, I've included the complete list. So if you want, I can send this around. Um, I've got the whole list of, of all the books that I covered in this talk. Uh, are there any uh, questions? Let's see. I'm gonna have to... uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so I was saying in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to the announcements. We're running quite late this evening. I apologize, I apologize Joel, but a fantastic presentation. And I really, we really enjoyed you uh, showing us the books right off the shelf. It was, uh, it was very interactive. Well done. Um, let's go on to uh, Ralph Chu with the announcements for this evening then. Oh, I'm told that they need a moment to set up uh, the Ralph's uh, slides. Hang on a second. Okay, can you hear me okay? All right, and we're back with Ralph and the announcements. Okay. Well, let me start by saying thank you to our speakers this evening for a really interesting uh, set of talks tonight. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed them very much. And uh, there's lots to think about, especially with uh, what Colin was saying about the technology of astroimaging coming up. So thank you very much again for your presentations tonight. Okay, let's take a look at what's coming up over the next little while. Our next meeting is our first speaker's night since the uh, pandemic shut down at the Science Center. Uh, and so we will have an online presentation on the evening of uh, September 30th. And our speaker is Alyssa Obertus, who is with the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto. And her talk is going to be on how to destroy a planet. And uh, she's got some interesting ideas on that respect. So that should be a really uh, fascinating talk. Our next uh, uh, recreational astronomy night 
is going to be on the 14th of October. And uh, so far we have Arnold Brody confirmed uh, to present the sky this month. But Paul tells me that he's still got two open slots available for uh, presentations. So if you're tempted to uh, uh, do a presentation, please let him know. And I'm sure he'll be happy to put you in for either uh, this meeting or the one in November. Okay, uh, as you know, um, the COVID numbers are rising. And so um, there's a lot of concern about uh, what happens with trying to do any kind of uh, programs for the public. Uh, what we are now doing is planning for virtual star parties. Uh, we have something that uh, is uh, being set up with the Science Center, hopefully for uh, the end of October uh, to look at the moon and Mars. Um, but um, it's still in the um, early stages of getting that uh, underway. Uh, and uh, as the year goes on, we will try to look at other opportunities to do virtual programs. Uh, it's not the same, obviously, and there's lots of uh, technical problems with that, but we are trying to continue with programs of some sort. Similarly, we've had to suspend our observing programs. I know members have been going out to the various locations like Lawn Sioux and uh, uh, Glen Major Forest to do observing on their own, and that's great. And uh, we're happy to have the forum uh, uh, for email to uh, have people use that to make arrangements. But uh, formal programs that are offered by the center, again, are suspended uh, until uh, COVID numbers uh, come down. Uh, we are planning on a special online outreach event uh, that will be uh, on the 6th and 12th of October, so two nights where we will be doing an online presentation uh, uh, using the auspices of the David Dunlap Observatory uh, uh, and the facilities um, of the City of Richmond Hill. Uh, to present the opposition of Mars. Uh, unfortunately, because it is a city event, that means that it is going to be a, a ticketed uh, program with a charge for the online participation. Um, there's not much we can do about that and we'll just have to see what happens with it, but we do plan to uh, have virtual observing through the 74 inch telescope plus other instruments and some uh, short presentations through the evening. So we'll have more uh, information about that online as the um, uh, plans get crystallized. But um, again, uh, we're definitely looking at the 6th and the 12th to do something uh, to mark the opposition of Mars. And we'll hope, as Chris was saying, that uh, we don't get a planetary-wide um, uh, dust storm uh, like the last time around. Uh, a quick reminder that there are uh, a variety of um, uh, online presentations being uh, hosted by the society uh, at rsc.ca, and um, uh, they have things on their YouTube channel as well, so please take a look at those. Uh, you'll find a lot of really interesting presentations for you to look at, and uh, they have more that are being announced all the time. Uh, as far as the CAR uh, observatory is concerned, I'm happy to uh, uh, announce, and it was announced on the email forum yesterday as well, that uh, we now have uh, put in arrangements to uh, make it possible for people to occupy the um, uh, lower level of the house as well as the upper level so that uh, we can have uh, two parties or two families uh, staying in the house at the same time. Uh, this obviously is something that will allow for us to uh, uh, use the uh, CAO during the winter months as well as uh, now. And uh, we are uh, setting up uh, the necessary protocols uh, for that to proceed. Uh, you can book online. There's a number of additional hoops you'll have to go through uh, in order to um, 
uh, fulfill the uh, COVID precautions, but the CAO is there uh, for your enjoyment and use. And I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Um, one of the things that uh, we are going to have to look at is what other arrangements we can make for use of instruments up there um, because of the uh, problems of uh, cross-contamination possibly with eyepieces and so on. That's still not a problem that we've solved yet, but uh, we are working on uh, some solutions to that as well. So uh, again, CAO is open for business and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to use it. Uh, we are looking at uh, trying to arrange for overnight parking during the winter. Um, there have been some changes um, in the circumstances up there with changes in ownership of neighboring properties. So some of the arrangements that we've used in previous years no longer are uh, available to us. Uh, we're looking for other uh, ways of um, allowing for parking in the area. But again, uh, we're working on that and we'll make the announcements about that as uh, these things uh, come to fruition. So still a lot of things to work on, even though a lot of our activities are shut down. Uh, the only other thing I'll say at this point is that we are planning for uh, annual meetings and other uh, gatherings that will all be online for the foreseeable future until such time as the Science Center uh, can reopen. And uh, again, we will let you know as, um, opportunities arise. So that's it for now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming online tonight to watch this uh, uh, gathering. And we'll see you in two weeks for our Speakers Night program. Good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. Clear skies. Stay safe.